Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. We're going to get started in about two minutes. So thank you for um, joining in. We'll give everybody a few minutes to log in and get um, set up and get your microphones and your cup of coffee for the day. Um, and then we will get started. All right, well, we're gonna start right on time today, hopefully, um, and hopefully everybody is logging in and realizing they're in the right place. Uh, you're always in the right place when you're at OpenShift Commons. Today, I'm really thrilled to be hosting a gathering on data science and wanna welcome you all to the Commons um, and tell you a little bit about what the Commons is. And my name is Diane Mueller. I'm the Director of Community Development and um, the person behind the screen today driving and hosting um, this event along with some of my colleagues um, who will be uh, also in the chat and helping to answer any of your questions. Um, you can follow us on Twitter at OpenShift Commons um, without the S and we've got a hashtag today of OSCG2021 because this is our first OpenShift Commons gathering of 2021 and um, we're really pleased that you're here with us today. So. Um, just a word about Red Hat and about how we view the world and, um, and all of the dif different pieces and parts of um, today's talks are about. Um, this is the community side of OpenShift and one of the spaces that we've created for the entire ecosystem of projects and products and communities that are part of the uh, Red Hat OpenShift ecosystem. Um, and really what today is about is about making connections that will help drive um, continuous innovation into all of your projects, all of your um, efforts at your organizations, and it's really all about you guys. And so ask questions in the chat. Um, we'll talk a little bit about today's agenda. I, what I like to say often, and you'll see it on the t-shirts and swag when we're in person, um, is that we have more in common than you know. And today I hope you all will discover that. Today really is, and the whole purpose and goal of Commons um, is create connections. And today, um, please expect um, one of my new favorite words, entanglements, as well. So we're going to be doing a lot of um, talks today that um, are introducing new initiatives, um, new community, and where they overlap. There will also be some fluidity, as I like to say. Um, a lot of these talks of time um, allotted right afterwards for some live Q&A um, and we expect um, some of that maybe to run over or run under so we're going to try and, and keep everything on track today that's that's my job um, and we do want to hope that you all respect the code of conduct and respect each other um, and uh, you can use the Q the Q&A tag in um, the blue jeans to ask questions um, and the question that everybody always asks right up top is, um, can we have the slides? Will the recordings be available and when? And what are the next steps? So um, yes, the slides are available and we'll post the, the GitHub repo where I've put them all um, in the chat shortly. And all of the recordings um, of all of the talks, except for the one that's going to be live today, um, Marcel Hill's um, Beyond AI Ops talk, um, I will have to edit that and upload it later this afternoon, but they will all be on YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com slash OpenShift um, shortly after this, give me 30 minutes or so after this session, today's thing ends, um, they will be live there and you can watch them and review the slides there. So yes, um, we tried to take care of that. Next steps, there's lots of next steps. Um, next steps will be, um, let me talk a little bit about what OpenShift Commons is and what our schedule is today. Um, it's pretty beefy. 
Um, and Commons is always about crossing ecosystem lines. Um, our first keynote speaker will be um, an academic, um, which is wonderful. Kate Fenko is coming from Boston U University and MIT IBM Watson's uh, AI lab, um, and we are thrilled to have her today. We have folks um, from on the enterprise research side from Ericsson Research. We have the folks from um, America Mobile are going to be talking about a new initiative. Um, they're kicking off um, called the Enterprise Neurosystem. I love the neurosystem metaphor um, because it does, again, go along with the entanglement and the overlapping of things across silos. There's another um, new community or a uh, reorganized, um, rebranded community of ML Commons that's what we're going to have a panel on. We're going to talk a lot about open source today and the Open Data Hub um, and talk about the toolbox that we're working on here at Red Hat um, to support data scientists. Um, and then Verizon Media is going to um, kind of come on and talk about doing some really cool stuff with their project, Leo. And um, then we have a couple of NVIDIA GPU operator things. And so, you know, we're really trying to give you some of the building blocks that you need at, to come in to uh, do the workloads that you're looking at um, with data science, whether it's on the enterprise side, the research side, or um, just trying to drive open source projects. So, Please, at the bottom there is also the link to the, um, the agenda, which will be up all day, and we'll try and stick to it. So OpenShift Commons really, truly is, um, it's all about you guys. Um, it's about the different communities, the different projects, all of the stakeholders, whether they're end users, our partners, and, um, and contributors to all of these projects. Really, we do better when we all work together, and um, we'd love to have you join Commons or any of the other organizations that are going to talk today. Um, we'll hopefully put their resource links up too. So if you're interested in joining Commons, just go to the Commons website, fill in the join form, and we'll add you in um, happily. So really, just a word about what Commons is. It's really, rather than focusing on one um, open source project like Kubernetes or OpenShift itself or OKD, we really recognize that um, OpenShift is really an ecosystem-based universe now. Um, and so we've tried to create a new community model that brings in all of the different communities, the upstream projects, and to really promote peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So today's job is really to try and help you um, connect with each other, to make some connections um, and hopefully um, join us and help foster some innovation. And it really is across multiple ecosystems. Um, we play a lot um, in the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and every one of the projects there is interlinked um, and interconnected. And whether it's you're using any Kubernetes distribution or our open source side, which is OKD, or um, OpenShift itself in its many variations. You are going to be touching, if you're in data science, all of the top uh, the projects, and these are just a few of them that are some of the upstream data science initiatives that you'll hear about today. Um, and hopefully you'll be um, enticed to take a look at Open Data Hub as well, which is one of the wonderful projects that we've been pushing um, and creating a, a reference architecture around and, and supporting our data scientists with. You'll hear a, a deep talk about that. And then there's the ML Commons folks and who have just rebranded and taken in ML Perf. So there's lots of different places to, um, that, that we touch these different ecosystems. And Red Hat, this is how Red Hat kind of sees AI. Um, we, it re represents a workload um, that is a, definitely a requirement for our platforms to support across hybrid clouds. Um, it's applicable to Red Hat's existing business. We use um, these tools that you're going to hear about today inside to um, increase the, our open source development and production um, efficiencies. We know that it's really valuable to our customers for specific services, and we really are trying to create that intelligent platform experience and really helping you all um, build those intelligent apps um, using our products as well as the broader partner ecosystem. And underneath that, um, data is the foundation of all of that. So you'll hear a lot about all of these things um, today. But one of the things that I was going to ask everybody who's here today first to kick this off while I kick off the first video is in the chat, how do you see AI? 
because I've been looking um, at, there's been a whole ton of people who've registered for, for this event, and I've been really um, amazed at the range of people who um, and the roles that you have. Um, they're AI leaders, researchers, analysts, application development managers, big data engineers, data modelers, all kinds of folks right down to container platform engineers and data scientists. So in the chat, while I queue up the first keynote um, speaker here, take a minute and if you don't mind, um, tell us where you're from, you know, where in the world are you today um, and what role you have um, in terms of what you're doing in AI. Are you a data scientist? Are you a platform engineer? Are you an upstream person? Um, are you in compliance or risk management? Where, what are you doing um, in AI? How do you see AI? So just take a minute, try and um, test out the chat there and um, see if we can rock and roll there. So the other thing that I wanted to do today, um, so our first speaker um, is gonna be Kate Sanko um, and I'll cue her up in a minute. But I really wanted to thank um, some of the other folks from Red Hat who've helped me um, build out today and hear this. We, you'll see our faces on the screens every once in a while. Uh, Sherard Griffin, Chris Short, who's hosting this in doing the live streaming side of this, and um, Audrey Resnick, who will be joining us in a little bit, and um, Bill Wright, who's been on the partner side, um, helping us get some of this uh, all working and going. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a minute, queue up the video, try and keep us all on time, and um, I'm only one minute behind. So thank you again for joining us today, and um, I hope you enjoy the day. I really enjoyed interacting with all of the different speakers. So I'll share my screen now and cue up a video. Hi, my name is Kate Sayanka. I'm a professor at Boston University and at the MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about my research on data set bias. So um, I'm going to start with talking about the success of AI and computer vision. So computer vision is um, AI technology that can analyze visual scenes, and you can see here an example of it applied to detecting cars and buses and pedestrians and images, and it's quite good um, and getting better. So here's an example of um, computer vision for object detection in a different scene. We can also train computer vision models to classify other objects that are maybe even cartoon characters. Um, and we have quite uh, accurate models for face recognition, emotion recognition. And a lot of this is becoming a product, right? So we're seeing computer vision being used as a product, maybe in your phone, you might have a face ID that uh, verifies your face against the database to unlock, unlock your phone. So that's um, very exciting. However, we also have some problems with this technology, with um, computer vision, but it also applies to machine learning in general, which is the problem of data set bias. Uh, that's what I want to talk about today. So what do I mean by data set bias? Well, suppose that you're training a model to recognize pedestrians. And you collected a data set uh, that looks something like this, and you train your neural network and um, it seems to work really well on your held out test data from the same kind of data that you collected. And now you deploy your model on your um, product on, on a car, but now this car is in New England, whereas your training data was in California. So immediately you see a very different visual domain with different weather conditions like snow, for example, that you didn't have in training data because there's not much snow in California. Um, but also pedestrians will look different because they're wearing heavy coats and so on. So all of a sudden the model that worked really well on your source 
data that you trained it on does not work so well anymore. And so we call this problem data set bias. Uh, we also call it domain shift. So, uh, the, so the problem of data set bias is essentially this issue that the training data looks different from your test data that you're actually faced with. Um, it, it's different in terms of the distribution of data. That's the more general way of putting it, but you, you might uh, qualify it, for example, as a difference between one city that you trained on and the new city that you're testing on. Or it could be a data set bias to uh, images collected on the web, uh, whereas at test time you are getting images from a robot, which also looks look different. They have uh, different backgrounds, different lighting, and different pose. Um, another common data set shift that we see in machine learning is from simulation to real images. Um, <clears throat> so here, for example, if you're simulating something for robotics and training your machine learning algorithm on the simulated data, it's not going to generalize very well to real data. Um, this could also happen with demographics. For example, if your training data is uh, biased in a way that where light-skinned faces are overrepresented in the training data, but then at test time you are applying the model to darker skin faces, again, you will have a data set bias issue and the model will not work as well on the test data. Uh, this could also happen with different cultures. Let's say you're classifying weddings and you trained on Western weddings of, uh, from, from Western cultures. Uh, and then at test time, if you get uh, an image of a, a, a wedding from a different culture, your classifier will not generalize very well, will not uh, be able to recognize it. So, so there are lots and lots of different ways that data set bias could happen. Uh, which, that's my point. Um, now let's look, about, look at what actually this means in terms of the accuracy of the machine learning model. <clears throat> so here is a very simple example, very famous data set called MNIST. Everyone knows what MNIST is. It's just 10 digits that are handwritten. So if we train on this data set, we know with modern deep learning, we can get very high accuracy of more than 99% accuracy. However, if we train for the same 10 classes of digits, but our training data looks like this, this is a street view house numbers data set. Now this model tested on the MNIST data set achieves much lower performance, 67% accuracy. That's really, really bad for this problem. And by the way, even when the data set bias is not as extreme, for example, we train on the USPS digits, which look to the human eye, look quite similar to MNIST, and yet the bias in the data leads to a similar drop in performance. And if you're curious, if we swap and we train on MNIST and test on USPS, we have similarly poor performance. So, so that's just an example of how this data set bias could affect, even in a simple case of digit classification, could affect accuracy. Okay, now what about real-world implications of data set bias? Have we seen this in the real world? Well, yes, uh, I believe we have. This is one example that's quite famous now, um, which is uh, the fact that in face recognition or gender classification, uh, some researchers have actually evaluated how well commercial, existing commercial systems from Amazon, from IBM, from other companies, how well they uh, work, what, what is the accuracy they achieve on different demographics. And you can see here, according to one study, they work a lot worse on African American and uh, female faces than on Caucasian and male faces. So. Again, that's an, in large part due to data set bias. Um, another very sad example of potential data bias is this ac accident uh, that the self-driving vehicle was involved in a while back, the Uber self-driving car, um, which according to some reports did not recognize the pedestrian because it was not designed to detect pedestrians outside of a crosswalk. So if that's in case, it, if that's your data set bias, that in your data set all the pedestrians are on a crosswalk, then yes, your 
uh, machine learning algorithm will not be able to recognize them as well if they're not in that context of a crosswalk, but maybe in this case, you know, just jaywalking without a crosswalk. So you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, can't we just fix this by collecting more data? Uh, if we don't have uh, pedestrians not in crosswalks, let's just collect more data like that, right? Well, there are a few problems with that. The first is that some types of events just might be rare, like jaywalking pedestrians, they just might be very rare events. And we may not necessarily want to force people to jaywalk so we can collect more data. Um, so that's one problem, but another really big problem is the cost of data collection. So imagine that we wanted to label uh, images from cars that an example you see here, this is from the Berkeley BDD data set. Uh, well, labeling uh, 1,000 pedestrians with per pixel segmentation labels that you see here, where the label has to uh, identify each pixel that belongs to that pedestrian, it's quite expensive. So it costs maybe about $1,000 per 1,000 pedestrians. And now if you Imagine the huge sheer variety of visual data that we would want to cover in our data set. Uh, we want multiple poses, we want multiple genders, age, race, clothing, style, and so on and so on. And like, And somewhere in there we want people who are riding bicycles, maybe not riding bicycles, or maybe riding tricycles, right? So if you think about you know, how many different factors of variation we would have to cover, this very quickly becomes untenable and, and just too expensive to collect label data that's balanced across all of these uh, variation factors. So what um, actually causes poor performance, right? You might be wondering that as well. Well, you know, can't my deep learning algorithm just get better? Maybe I just need a better algorithm that will generalize and uh, do better on uh, test data. So there are a couple of problems uh, that is caused by data set bias that current models cannot handle. The first problem is that the training and test data distributions are different. So here you have an example of two digit domains. The blue points and the red points are from these two digit domains. And you can see that uh, when we visualize this data, uh, we do this by extracting features from these images using the deep learning model that we trained and then plotting it in a TSNE visualization. So this is what we get. You can see that clearly the distribution of the training blue points is very different from the distribution of the test points. And so this is a, a theoretical problem actually when these distributions are different. We can show that theoretically there actually bounds on how well our model will generalize. Another problem is uh, that a model trained on the blue points is not as discriminative. So the features it learned are not as discriminative for the target red domain. And you can see that because the blue points are much better clustered into different categories than the red points, right? So you just may not be learning uh, good features uh, for these test points, the, the target domain. So fortunately, there are quite a few techniques that we can use to alleviate this. I've listed a bunch here. What I want to talk about here uh, today is the technique of domain adaptation. Um, but, um, you know, there's always data augmentation. There's always uh, using um, sort of batch normalization. Some of these techniques can uh, help in, in the case of data set bias. But let's talk about domain adaptation. So in domain adaptation, we um, design a new machine learning approach that tries to adapt the knowledge from the labeled source data to the unlabeled target domain. Okay, so our goal here is to learn a classifier that achieves a low expected loss under the target distribution. And importantly here we assume that we have a lot of labeled data in the source domain but we also get to see unlabeled data from our target domain. We just don't get to see the labels, right? Because labels are expensive uh, to collect. So we assume that we uh, do get to see some unlabeled data, at least from the target domain. So what can we do? 
Well, the first technique, it's very, um, I would say, fairly common now and fairly standard in the literature, uh, which is adversarial domain alignment. So here we want to take a neural network, which I'm showing here as this encoder convolutional neural network, because we're dealing with images, so we always use convolutional networks. And we have some training data with labels. And now, so if we train this using regular classifier loss, we can generate features from our encoder CNN. And here I'm just showing it for two classes for clarity. And then the last layer will be our classifier layer. So we can visualize the decision boundary that it learns between one class and the other class. Now, if we also get to see some unlabeled data from our target domain, so let's say we put a camera on the robot and it can explore its environment and, and snap some photos, so now it has some data, it's just not labeled. Um, and so if we apply the encoder CNN trained on the source directly to this data, we already know that we'll see a data set shift like this. So the distribution of the target points will be shifted with respect to the distribution of the source blue points. And so in adversarial domain alignment, our goal now is to align these two distributions, the blue source distribution and the orange target distribution. So how can we do this? Uh, well, a very standard approach is to add another piece to the neural network, which we call the domain discriminator. This is just a classifier that tries to assign a domain label to these input examples. And it, if we train it with a GAN loss, with a, an adversarial loss, essentially, then we iterate uh, between the domain discriminator trying to separate the distributions, and then in the next step, we update the encoder in such a way that it can fool the discriminator so the discriminator's accuracy goes down. And in the process, the encoder learns to align the two distributions so that if everything goes well, the, the discriminator can no longer cannot tell the difference between the domains, and these features have become domain invariant, essentially. <clears throat> so that's adversarial alignment. And here's an example of it working for those two-digit domains that I showed you earlier. And you can see that, in fact, after adaptation with adversarial alignment, the two distributions of the red and the blue points have now been aligned almost perfectly. And in fact, classification also goes up considerably, um, so it's not just that the distributions are aligned, it actually does improve classification accuracy. Another technique that I want to mention is um, alignment in pixel space. So what I mean by that is, suppose, again, we have source data with labels and some unlabeled target data, and now instead of just doing adaptation with alignment like I just showed you, what if we first translate our source data in image space, so we're generating new images from the originals, but now these new images look like they come from the target domain. Um, so this is a similar idea of aligning the two data sets, but now we're, we're aligning them in pixel space because we're actually generating the images themselves and not just uh, generating features. So the advantage uh, is that once we've done that, if we're able to train this generative uh, adversarial network that can translate from the source to the target domain, now we have data that looks like it came from the target domain, but it has labels because the original data is from the source, so it's labeled with the categories that we need for training. And by the way, we can still add feature alignment on the feature space to this overall architecture. And in fact, we have experimented with that in our paper, which is at the bottom, so if you're interested, you can take a look. But if we do, do both feature and pixel space alignment, that can further improve our performance on the target domain. OK, uh, well, that's great. This pixel space alignment seems pretty neat. But so far, we've been assuming that we have unlabeled target data. In fact, what I didn't tell you is that in order for that method to work, it needed to see quite a lot of unlabeled data from the target domain. But what if we only get 
one image or a couple images from our target domain? Well, unfortunately, the existing method like CycleGAN or Cicada that I showed you doesn't quite work. Um, so instead, what we need to do is take a source domain image, which is our content essentially, and we want to translate it to a new visual domain, but we only have one example, let's say, of that domain. So in this example, our, our content is a dog, and we want to preserve the pose of the dog, but we want to change the style uh, or the domain of the dog into this other breed. I don't, unfortunately, don't know what breed of dog. Maybe you know what breed of dog this is. Uh, but anyway, we just have one example of this new breed. And so we uh, actually propose a method that can do this, and this is the result. Uh, so you can see in the generated image, we took the original source image and we added the style of the target image, uh, but preserving the pose of the dog, right? So the content is preserved. So uh, this method, we call it CocoFunit, uh, was published recently in ECCV 2020. Um, I'm not going to go through the details because I don't have time, um, but essentially the model takes a content image and a style image, encodes it using a content encoder and a style encoder, and then combines these two encodings using an image decoder to generate the output image. Here are more examples. So we have the style image on the top and then the content image below it. And then the resulting generated image with our CocoFunit approach at the bottom. We can take a look and see <clears throat> that um, we're able to, even just using a few, uh, sometimes just one, we've tried one or a couple images of the target domain here. The domain is a breed of the animal or a breed of an animal. So we can change um, <clears throat> the pose is the same from the dog, but the, um, sorry, the, the, the pose is the same from the content image, but the breed is, uh, you, is taken from the style image. So you can see how um, this is working quite well. And if you're curious, compared to the previous approach, which is which was called FUNIT, that we're building on actually, um, we're improving on that quite a bit because as you can see, FUNIT is not able to um, translate images using just a single style image. Uh, it's kind of generating fairly poor results in this case. And on average, when we evaluate on a large data set, we also see significant gain using our uh, Cocoa Funit approach. So that's another example of pixel domain translation. Um, one other example that I want to show you really quickly is um, using this idea for adaptation in robotics. So here we have a robot that's trying to insert an object into another object, let's say a peg into a hole, or is trying to, more generally we can apply this to other manipulation tasks. Um, and our input data is coming from the depth sensor, so it looks like this. So there's an RGB image, but what we're using is actually the depth image. So you can see it in the, in the middle here. But um, to train, so we want to train a computer vision model and neural network that will control the robot arm to perform the task. But to train, we want to use simulated images. So we simulate this kind of problem and generate fake uh, depth images and train the, the neural network. But the problem that we run into is, of course, we have a gap between the training domain of simulated data and the target domain of real depth images. And so what we tried is using pixel level domain translation to solve this data set bias problem without collecting any label data in the target real domain. So you can see here an example, um, a real depth view image, and then a similar simulated image. And then the last one is we take the real and we translate it into the simulated domain and you can see that it's now looking a lot more like the simulated data. So we're closing this domain gap. Okay, great. So um, I'm gonna wrap up here just to recap what I talked about. Um, so data set bias is a pretty major problem for 
machine learning in general, but for computer vision specifically, that's mostly what I work on, so that's what I focused on. And um, I showed you a couple of ways that we can mitigate this problem using either feature space domain alignment or pixel space domain alignment. Um, I also think, you know, we could discuss if we have time after this, some even more general ethical issues related to data sets. For example, recently there was a, a paper that's generating quite a, a lot of interest um, that looks at um, the dangers of large language models and points out that language models are being trained on progressively larger and larger data sets. So it's almost like the opposite of the problem that I talked about where we have a huge data set that we're training on. And now the problem <clears throat> that they're, they're pointing out is that this data set might contain all kinds of bad data, like offensive data um, or just, you know, even uh, private data. And by training the model on it, we don't know what kind of biases or bad uh, undesirable um, uh, things that it's learning, right? So, so that's that's kind of a, a related but different ethical issue. Uh, and this paper, by the way, is uh, one of the co-authors is Timnit Gebru, which you might have heard that actually she was forced to leave Google over this specific paper. So, um, yeah. So there are quite a few ethical issues, and I'm happy to discuss that or anything related to what I talked about and. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Th thank you, Kate. And um, hopefully everybody uh, enjoyed that. Uh, right, Kate, there's a couple of questions, Kate. And um, if you could just say hi, and so I know I can hear you. Hello. Hi, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, we have about five minutes, so um, and some of them look a little deep. But um, Alex is asking, um, when using techniques like Coco Funnet, doesn't it use isn't it using generated data to reinforce the model to recognize content that is that may never actually encounter? Um, I think we talked a little bit about this um, in the talk. But the research is is proving a benefit to filling in the gaps. Is that? Um, I'm yeah. I'm just still trying to understand the question. So yeah. it, the question is: When using techniques like CocoFun, that doesn't using generated data then reinforce the model to recognize content that it may never actually encounter. Um, I'm not sure I'm following the question. So I guess one issue with using generated data is that um, it's not realistic. It's not. It doesn't look uh, always like a real image, even though some of the generated data is fairly photorealistic, but not always. Um, and then the other downside could be just not uh, not achieving a high degree of variability. Uh, scans tend to, like the big mode collapse, they tend to learn just uh, one or two modes of the distribution. So you could have uh, low variability in generating data. So those are all definitely downsides um, for training on that data. But but the upside is that you at least are generating more diverse data than you had before, because you're augmenting your data with this generated multi-domain data. So um, of course, it's always better to train on real diverse domains, but if you don't have access to real diverse domains, then I think it's a close second. Close second, yes. I love the example you gave um, the other day about the crosswalks and, and the cars and the crosswalks and not seeing that with the the, dot, the, the cars, the automated uh, car driving example. That was a good one of not having enough and that maybe some of the generated would help with that. There's one uh, one more question from Herbert asking if you have any examples of using this on structured data. Um, yeah, so uh, there are some applications of domain application techniques to text, uh, which is, I guess you could consider that more structured than images. Um, 
And for applications like image captioning, for example, where your task is to take an image and uh, generate a, a descriptive caption that says what is in that image, or perhaps answer questions, visual question answering. Uh, these, are, these are the academic tasks I know of where there's more structure in the data. Um, because I work in computer vision primarily and natural language processing, that's what I mostly encounter. Um, I think you could also apply this to documents because, like PDF documents, because they have uh, a lot of similarities to images. Um, uh, they have, actually, you can treat them as images, but they also have more structure um, uh, because they are often generated um, according to some rules. So yeah, I think um, they could also apply to documents. All right. Well, um, Kate, if you can hang out a little bit for online chat um, in the background. Um, I really wanted to thank you for coming and talking about this because I think uh, though you're doing all the, the brown, groundbreaking research and academic side of things, and a lot of the folks who are here on the call today are probably coming at, from the enterprise, and maybe we don't think enough about um, how to understand the data set biases and how to um, rectify them. So I think this has really been um, awesome um, to help inspire us to look beyond our um, data sets that we usually just use um, and without thinking. So I um, totally appreciate you coming here today and doing this um, talk. Um, so I'm going to now queue up the next talk, um, which is um, uh, more on the enterprise side, but it's um, Paul McLaughlin is coming from Ericsson Research, and he's going to talk about, um, he got everything, every buzzword in this title, um, sustainability, machine learning, AR, VR, and 5G, and AI for good. So going off um, on the data set bias and going to the next stage of applying it. So thanks again, Kate, for um, coming and joining us today. And again, um, we really appreciate everybody's um, questions. So thanks, and keep those questions coming. So here, let me queue Thanks up. for having me. It was great to be here. All right. Thanks so much. And here comes the next one. Good afternoon, I'm Paul McLaughlin. I'm AI Research Leader, and I'm part of Ericsson Research based in Santa Clara, California. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about how Ericsson is using AI to help address sustainability and climate change. Because we know that climate change is real and having devastating impacts now. Humans have caused one degree centigrade of global warming above pre-industrial levels. And NASA and NOAA say that 2020 was the second hottest year on record globally. Climate change is causing extreme weather events, which are the most visible effect of climate change. But the frequency of extreme weather, like wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, thunderstorms, is increasing in the United States. And in 2019, extreme weather cost $45 billion in the United States alone. This also has pretty important societal impacts because climate change damages hit low-income Americans in the South hardest, and minorities and people of color bear a disproportionate share of the climate change burden. The time to act is running out. So what do we need to do? The carbon law teaches us that emissions must be cut by half every decade to reach net zero by 2050. So by 2030, the information and communication technology sector can have a massive impact towards that goal. In 2020, 54 gigatons, which is a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions came from the ICT sector. So following the carbon law to avoid catastrophe, emissions needed to have peaked last year. And between 2030, the 2020 and 2030, we need to have a further 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and for every decade following that until 2050. At the same time, we also have to invest in carbon sinks like forests to help capture some of the carbon we've already emitted. 
action is required right now. Otherwise, the longer we delay, the bigger and faster reduction is required. Digitalization, though, is an exponential technology which will help us address this target even more quickly. Erickson research indicates that the ICT sector can enable reductions in global and greenhouse gas emissions by 15% globally. And this is based on existing ICT technology. More opportunities to go exceed that 15% will likely be enabled by technologies like 5G and machine learning and AI that Ericsson is investing in heavily. We see a particularly big impact on the energy, industry, and transportation sectors, which I'll be walking you through some examples, as well as speaking to my own research on AR and VR and how that will help address uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But the main point is that decarbonization solutions ex exist today. We don't need to wait for a silver bullet. And the estimated financial benefit of low carbon is $26 trillion by 2030 for reference. So we have an incredible opportunity ahead of ourselves. So Ericsson is leading the way and we are reducing emissions and impact of our company's activities, our products and services, and this also will have a dramatic impact on society. And so our goal is to be carbon dioxide neutral by 2030, which speaks to our company's impact. And this includes the fleet vehicles and facilities, but our goal is for 5G to be 10 times more efficient than 4G, which speaks to the impact of our products. Because 30% of network OPEX today comes from energy consumption, and 90% of mobile network operator emissions are from network power. So, for example, we are building a smart factory in Louisville, Texas. Uh, we are pursuing LEED Gold and LEED Zero Carbon certifications, and 90% of the materials for that factory will be diverted from landfill. landfill. We've installed 1,600 solar modules, and we produce over a million kilowatt hours annually, which is enough to power 93 U.S. homes for a year. We have water recapture uh, tanks, so we can capture and reuse rainwater, uh, which is enough for us to, uh, enough water for one US home for 133 days. So this is an example of how Ericsson is actually investing to ensure that our products uh, are sustainable and helping us show how manufacturing can transition towards a low carbon future. We also want to reduce the impact of digital networks. So the ICT sector's carbon footprint is estimated to be 1.4% of the global total. One thing I really want to point out, because I think it's remarkable and it shows how we are using technologies like AI today, is that emissions have remained constant while data traffic has quadrupled and the number of subscribers has increased by 30%. And one of the main reasons for that is because we've seen big energy efficiency gains from technology shift, uh, from the technology shift from desktop and laptop to handheld. But the ICT sector has decarbonization solutions that can get us to, can, they can help lead to a 50% energy reduction or emission reduction by 2030. So things like renewable electricity to power networks, the ICT sector today is the largest purchaser of renewable power, mobile network efficiency, where we can see Ericsson's leadership uh, role in innovation, uh, but we worry that energy consumption will increase dramatically if 5G is deployed like 3G and 4G were. So Ericsson's technology leadership is breaking this energy curve. Uh, hardware modernization can drive up to 30% reduction in power with higher data throughput, and software can drive up to 50% reduction in power with no impact to consumers. This allows operators to decouple mobile data traffic growth from energy consumption and carbon emissions. We're also transforming transportation. So transportation emissions constitute 60% of the global total or 8.6 gigatons of CO2 per year. Commercial transport powered by renewable electricity is critical for decarbonization and a robust 5G innovation platform will be required for this future, for further development of this technology. A fully built out 5G network will be required to operate autonomous vehicles at a massive scale. 
So the challenge is, how do, how do we provide affordable and safe transportation and reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And an example of solution of this is Ericsson, a Swedish startup called Einride, and Swedish mobile operator Telia created an electric and autonomous transportation system that is safer and more sustainable. And the impact is that Einride says electric vehicles powered by renewable uh, renewables reduce carbon emissions of, of a logistics and work by up to 90%. Autonomous driverless commercial vehicles also have less downtime, more, more reliability, and lower total cost of ownership, and will also lead to better air quality. So how does 5G fit in? Uh, 5G enables higher speeds, lower latency, and increased reliability for the, for the network and capacity. We also think the digital divide is a critical component to sustainability as well, because the digital divide is most pronounced in rural and minority communities. Today in the United States, 37% of rural students lack adequate connectivity, and this has really critical impacts as schools are closed during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you lack connectivity, you cannot attend e-learning. And according to Deloitte, the digital divide currently costs the United States economy $130 million a day. So as an example of how Ericsson is, is tackling this problem, uh, the Rutland City Public School System partnered with Vermont Telephone and Ericsson, and we installed next generation 4G and 5G wireless radios and antennas in fewer than 10 days. So Vermont Telephone delivered modems and routers, which connected students to e-learning. Rutland City Public Schools delivered Google Chromebooks that have wireless connectivity. And this happened in not in weeks or months, but in less than 10 days. And homes in Rutland now have wireless speeds well above 10 meg 100 megabits per second, which enables students now to access world-class education and e-learning opportunities. And Ericsson is committed to this globally. So we are partnering with UNICEF to make this possible globally for students around the world to really bridge that digital divide. We also think that 5G will help enable a transition to renewables. So the United Nations says that by 2050, 80% of all the world's power needs to come from renewables. And this will help us get to that decarbonization that is critical for climate action. So the challenge for renewables to scale up is a, there's a large number of power generators, multiple solar panels and wind farms, and bi-directional energy distribution, power sold and purchased from a grid as needed. And we have fluctuations in power generation because renewables can sometimes be unpredictable. There may not be wind one day. So the solution to this problem is smart grids. More renewables means the distribution system operators need total control of power distribution networks and distribution system operators need to respond rapidly to balance power production and load to avoid outages. So the role of 5G is that distribution system operators see digitalization and connectivity as key enablers in transition to renewable power. Distribution system operators recognize cellular tech connectivity offers lower capex compared to cabling for grid communications and real-time power system management requires low latency communi uh, communication connection. Uh, and we can reduce interruptions by up to 75% with ICT compared to today's level, according to a Swedish uh, distribution system operator. Digitalization is also critical for the industrial sector. So the industrial sector currently accounts for 32% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the challenge to decarbonizing this is that the industrial sector needs to meet consumer demand while cutting emissions by 50% by 2030. So business as usual is not sustainable and we have to transition from linear to circular business models, which is what we think of as industry 4.0. And the role of connectivity and industrial process optimization is vast. So by 2024, 5G will cover 65% of the global population, and there will be 4.1, or we believe there will be 4.1 billion cellular IoT connections. And so that ubiquitous connectivity enables real-time measurement and real-time AI of industrial processes on a massive scale. 
the exponential roadmap shows that up to 20% reduction in annual energy intensity po is possible by real-time monitoring of processes, things like AI and energy use. And the AI itself will help us get to continual optimization of processes. So Ericsson is using connectivity in our smart factories today in Tallinn, uh, Estonia, and in the United States to implement use cases to increase efficiency and reduce our own carbon emissions. So we're showing how this can be done today. But the role of connectivity is really critical in enabling the circular economy because it, it increases the lifetime of products and enables reuse. For example, 60 to 75% of energy can be saved by using recycled instead of new steel and material reuse needs to grow. Digitalization can track materials and products from manufacturing and reducing waste by asset tracking, uh, tracking can ha really help during logistics as well. So I wanna pivot and talk about some of my own research because I was speaking to you a lot about it, er, uh, how Ericsson sees tackling this challenge across the industry, across all the industries we partner with and how connectivity plays a role. But the team I work on works on augmented and virtual reality, which are technologies that will help bring uh, full experiences to people. And we are thinking of this as it relates to carbon emissions, sustainability. And I'll give you an example. Air travel today uh, contributes to 2.5% of global CO2 emissions. And just a single round trip flight between New York and London produces 6.67 tons of carbon dioxide per passenger. While a lot of travel is incredibly important, it's something I personally love because I love to have the sense of being in a place, the smell, the taste, the sounds of a uh, taste of food, the sounds of the environment. But a lot of travel today is to take a tour of a factory or look at a demo of a product or shake an, a person's hand so they can conclude a business meeting. But what if I told you that we are working towards a vision using AI, 5G, and a lot of critical hardware research to enable people to have that same tactile experience from their own home? I'd like to show you a video about that. I get goosebumps every time I see that video. So our vision at Ericsson Research is that by 2025, we will be able to have advanced technology that will allow people to have full five sensory immersive experiences across a mobile network. And we think our vision by 2030 
is for people to be able to share things such as memories or thoughts using brain computer interfaces. One of the critical challenges that we are trying to solve using AI is spatial computing. So for us to have interactive content and experiences, we have to use AI to understand the physical environment around the user and the objects in those environments. And that means creating things like spatial maps and environmental understanding, but also enriching those spatial maps with semantic information. So not only do we know where an object is located or where buildings are located, we also know what types of objects they are, what the relationship the end user has with those objects. And this will really enable us to create that full five sensory content and experience. Because once we have that information, we can then generate overlays. And so these overlays are critical uses for AR and VR. So here as an example is what you might see through your headset when you go to pick up your rental car uh, in the future. So in order to place this overlay on top of your rental car with your return date, the price per day and the like, we have to understand the object, we have to understand the environment. We have to do this incredibly rapidly because users can experience uh, what we call virtual reality motion sickness if there is any delay greater than about 40 to 50 milliseconds. So this means we have to process data transmitted across the network or on the device itself and get a response within less time than it takes you to blink. So that's one of the key and critical challenges that we are working on in my team, and why we're excited for the latency for 5G, because that content placement is extraordinarily computationally complex. And we worry that people will not have that same, the same quality of experience unless we can have that computation at the edge, but also, to have the speed and latency for the algorithms for the network uh, so that all the overlays, the content, the entertainment that you see through your AR and VR headsets uh, are correctly placed and are personalized for you. This is a challenge though, because it also requires AI, it requires mobile network, it also requires headsets. And XR headsets or AR and VR headsets today are evolving rapidly. So today, there aren't any commercially available headsets that have embedded 5G chips inside of them. So that means that headsets and these experiences are not fully mobile yet, if you'll forgive the pun. AR and VR headsets, cannot, without 5G chips, cannot push connectivity and data processing over the network unless they're connected to Wi-Fi. So in that example I just showed you in the car rental pickup garage, the challenge will really be that without 5G or network connectivity, uh, we may not be able to get to calculate that overlay of without, unless you're connected to Wi-Fi. Once we have 5G chips inside of the headsets, people will be able to take this level of computation and interactivity with them wherever they go. And we also think that not only will 5G help address the mobility aspect, it solves a lot of the technical problems or it addresses a lot of the technical problems that are inherent uh, in spatial computing. So for example, one millisecond end-to-end -end latency is the standard for 5G. And that dramatically reduced headset, that dramatically reduced latency means that headsets can work with real-time data. So that means as objects or the environment changes in the, in the end user's field of view, we can track objects, we can correctly track overlays so that content and overlays in XR move with the environment and move with the end user. And 20 gigabits per second down speed, 10 gigabits per second up speed means we may not have to compress content or video as much so not only will you have content that reacts in real time, it will look real as well because we may not have to compress it as significantly. This will also really help with spatial computing because it will improve the accuracy and precision of environmental understanding algorithms like simultaneous localization and mapping. We also are really excited about the possibilities of edge computing for spatial computing. So pushing data processing uh, to the edge of the network really will enable rich experiences and immersive experiences that are mobile as well. And with edge computing, 
one millisecond uh, data travels at the speed of light. So one millisecond means that an edge computing facility can be located upwards of 50 miles from the end user. But we're also working to be able to think of how to make smaller edge facilities. It can be located even closer to the end user, which will really help us address that latency challenge for machine learning and AI. So if we can, for example, think about how to uh, distribute where data is processed, that will really help us reach that latency ceiling that is critical for quality of experience for AR and VR. And that 5G really means that the headsets and the form factors we will see are evolving rapidly. So if we can offload computing into the edge of the network or across the network, it means we can see, and we are starting to see, smaller headsets that have a physical form factor that is lighter and smaller in size. Once 5G radios are inside of these headsets, we'll be able to process and experience AR and VR content outside of the home that updates in real time with that incredible latency from 5G and the speed. Once we push processing into the edge of the network as well, we'll see longer battery life, or we believe we will see longer battery life because we will probably need fewer chips on, on the actual headsets. We don't need to have uh, ASICs that consume quite a lot of, of battery. So we will see people be able to wear their headsets all day long like they use their cell phone today. And the key piece I think is the most exciting for me is around collaboration. Because without connectivity, without 5G, and frankly without AI as well, people can't have a really difficult time collaborating. So if we wanted to have a business meeting in person or look at a product demo together, uh, it will be a challenge to make sure that we are seeing the same thing at the same time and to interact with it so we can change things and collaborate together, play games together, watch entertainment together. That's what the latency from 5G and the mobile network connectivity will enable is that collaboration. And just to give you a couple of examples, this is the Lenovo A3. So these are uh, headsets that are commercially available today. And we're already starting to see a dramatic change in the physical form factors. And this is an Enreal. So we are seeing headsets for AR and VR that are starting to look a lot like the glasses I'm wearing today. And that's our vision for how a, uh, and our vision is that the Internet of Senses is coming. And our vision, as I said, is for this to be have the technology in place by 2025 to enable full sensory internet and connectivity. And so as you can see in this image, we may tackle sustainability by needing, removing the need to travel and meet in person. So here we see a person having a business meeting with someone with a hologram. And because of the placement, because of the connectivity and latency from 5G, that hologram is able to travel with the person. You can share a secret and whisper, and you can shake that hologram's hand and feel the weight of their hand. So I really want to thank you for your time, for listening to me. The message I really want to impart you with is that climate change is real. It is critical that we address it. And every day that we wait, the problem gets a little bit harder to solve. But by solving climate change, like Erickson takes very seriously, it's not, a, it's not a solution or it's not a problem that has no solutions. Using existing technology, we can already get 15% reduction in greenhouse gases. And we at Ericsson think we can go even further than that. And we are really excited to be on this journey with you. Thanks so much. And I'm looking forward to your questions. <laughs>
built, designed, installed, and maintained, as well as all of the physical hardware and equipment for that. So when we talk about healthcare, when you talk, of, when you hear people mention things like uh, smart devices or connected healthcare facilities, they're likely thinking about using uh, our Ericsson built and designed networks. But uh, that's that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer. I would say probably the thing I'm most excited about uh, is things like telesurgery. So particularly with AR and VR, some of the use cases I talked about in the presentation, uh, you can also imagine that if we can have one millisecond end-to-end -end latency, uh, we could, for example, have a doctor uh, in here in San Francisco where I'm based perform remote surgery with a patient uh, in a rural area. And that also has a real implication for the digital divide. Uh, one of the themes I mentioned as well, because we want to see ultra reliable, uh, ubiquitous 5G across the world, across the country. And so, for example, for that telesurgery to happen, we would need to have 5G in rural communities uh, as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's all part and parcel, but I think that there's a lot of use cases where we could even have remote consultation because over current or earlier mobile generations of mobile networks, there could be upwards of a second or two delay between me taking an action here if I were a surgeon and a, a robot responding uh, in a hospital. And that's not really great in a surgery setting. So 5G helps address that. All right, well, we are already, uh, I mentioned earlier in the beginning that we're gonna be fluid today. Um, and there are a couple, couple other questions here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read off the one that was asked in chat here, um, and maybe you could answer that, and then the other one you could answer um, online in chat, the one from Razan in the, the Q&A. Um, there's one more question here about what are the political barriers to implementing some of your ideas? For example, um, if the electrical grid does not buy back electricity generated by consumers, i.e. all the solar panels I'm putting on my roof right now, um, there's less incentive to implement these ideas. So you know, have, I know you think a lot about these things, so I figure I give you a few few minutes. To <laughs> <laughs> so I can't speak to the political barriers about the energy grid because I would be ad-libbing an answer, but I can say that I actually lead a lot of our research related to trustworthiness and security. Uh, so I can speak a little bit more about that. And in terms of politics, we know that data privacy is extraordinarily critical and something I take just we take seriously at Ericsson, but I personally take extremely seriously. So I think that we are obliged as a research community to have the strictest and strongest of, of ethics in everything that we do. So we do start to see uh, questions related to privacy, transparency, and accountability for all AI systems. So particularly how algorithms would be audited, how we would uh, essentially, particularly for the first speaker as well, how we might measure things like bias. And we start to see that intersect with politics where regulators are starting to take an interesting or an interest in these topics. And I, I think that this is something that we, as a, at Erickson Research, we're about 800 people uh, globally. We take extremely seriously. Uh, we have adopted a trustworthy AI framework that's been accepted by the board of directors at Erickson. So it's something that, again, uh, in terms of the space and, and the domain that I know well, we are, are well in ahead of what actually politicians are asking us to do in terms of accountability and in terms of transparency and privacy. All right, well, um, thank you very much for your time today. I'm gonna queue up the next talk, um, which is another enterprise application of AI, um, and it's the Enterprise Neurosystem Initiative that's going on at America Mobile, and I'm gonna um, thank you again, Paul, and if you can answer that other question in the online chat, that would be great. Um, and so thanks again, and here we go with our next talk. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, I am very excited and pleased to uh, welcome two guests to this uh, presentation and conversation today. And uh, I'd like to turn to both uh, Raul and Carlo and have you introduce yourselves, and then we'll go ahead and do a brief presentation. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Carlo Piseno. I'm a core network planning director for America Mobile. I have been in the company for 15 years now. and uh, 
My main responsibilities are related to the adoption of new technologies for the network. I have uh, been leading the NFP and uh, SDM processes uh, recently for the group. And now uh, we are very focused on bringing a 5G and uh, all the cloud native uh, principles around it. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Fantastic. And uh, Raul. Hello, uh, my name is Raul Reyes. Uh, I am in charge of IT infrastructure and, and cloud services optimization. I have been in America Mobile for five years now. And my main focus uh, um, has been to enable and empower uh, the different and distributed teams in Latin America. So, so we can be uh, always evolving and always getting more of the innovation in the operation. Fantastic. And I, I want to thank you both. I mean, the partnership we've had with America Mobile has been nothing short of spectacular. We've been able to do some very exciting things. And over the years, it's culminated in uh, what we're about to talk about today. So I'm very excited to present this. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Yeah, let's see. Here. And there we go. And so uh, what I'd like to talk about today is the Enterprise Neurosystem Framework. And this is something we've all been talking about for quite some time. And uh, to set the stage, uh, I was in a conversation with Raul at a uh, beautiful restaurant in Mexico City called Loma Linda. And uh, he turned to me over lunch. And I, I've told the story before, so I, I'm sorry to repeat it. But uh, it was funny. He turned to me and he said, uh, what is Red Hat doing with uh, mobile networks and artificial intelligence? And uh, at the time, I said, absolutely nothing, because <laughs> it was still very early days. Uh, we were still kind of in that... Um, assessment mode to basically understand what the impact could be. And given the rigorous uptime requirements of mobile networks, uh, we were just kind of putting our feet in the water a little bit. And Raul really pushed us right into the water with that comment because I came back home, I reached out to a, a number of folks, including Chris Wright, our CTO, and some other people. And we started a small focus group to take a look at what this could eventually become as a uh, community uh, directive. And so, We've uh, been working on a long time together and I'm very excited to discuss it today. So here we go. Um, one of the core things we've thought about over the years is just that human and IT architectures share a, a number of strong similarities. And uh, we just noticed this more and more, especially with the advent of artificial intelligence, and which really is kind of the completion of this parallel model, you know, when you think about it. And you've got all these mobile devices, they could be considered almost nerve endings, they have the capability of, you know, hearing and you know, sound and, and visual identification. And then data centers really equal the brain's functions in a lot of ways, like uh, the cerebellum and memory and you know, processing CPUs. And so what's interesting is there really is a kind of a parallel model. You know, we as a you know, species have created something that's very similar you know, in, in many respects. And, and so in terms of the human body, the more core operations are fully autonomous, like the heartbeat, uh, chemical levels, the way we assimilate energy, and it still partitions conscious thought processes as part of that too. So it's really almost like two separate sets of uh, functions from that perspective. But the higher order or the, the core decisions are made by the conscious mind, which is really kind of firewalled away and coexists with these other systems in, in a real sense of harmony, but also developed and honed by evolution over many, many years to say the least. So we think Corporations are kind of similar in many ways, and there are many different functions in a corporation, and it can span many different countries. And so we thought over time that it would be interesting to tie together all these different data points and all these different functions essentially as a single instance, and to make it all part of a single framework. And that's where we have uh, ended up today, which is a new AI and machine learning telco community right now, which is called the Enterprise Neurosystem. And this is about AI infrastructure basically connected to every single business function across the enterprise. And we're definitely starting with telco from that perspective, but it will be applicable to all verticals because there are, you know, every corporation in the Fortune 500 is facing the same challenge. And founding partners include America Mobile, but also Verizon Media, Equinix, uh, Ericsson uh, Cove, Lambda Perceptor Labs, uh, Ernst & Young, Seagate, and uh, Watson's also involved in Really why it's needed is that AI models are being built and deployed in both kind of a do-it-yourself fashion and through different vendors. 
but without really a comprehensive integration framework or any kind of large scale federation at the moment. There are lots of small kind of point solutions and AI models being scattered around the enterprise and uh, connected to data lakes, et cetera. But in terms of taking all those elements and all that information and cross correlating it for larger scale insight and, and deeper insight, uh, that's something that we saw the need for and why we're starting this community. So it basically unifies and optimizes an entire multinational corporation at that scale with a single AI and ML framework. And it enables, like I said before, the overarching cross correlation of all these different data points. But then uh, what's interesting is over time, edge and core AI, all those instances become part of one system. And it just provides any form of management, whether it's you know mid-tier management or the, the C-suite with a real-time view of all operations. And we've thought about a lot of creative uh, applications for that, like a hologram advisor or a robotic advisor, you know, like down the road. But of course, it would just be, you know, on screen for the time being. But we're looking to the future to do some really cool and uh, kind of fun, innovative stuff. And so conceptually, uh, you know, if you take a look, we've got all the core open source components like Linux and Ceph Storage and Kubernetes, et cetera. And then we have the Open Data Hub framework, which allows you to use open source uh, AI uh, platform tooling to create models and get them into production and maintain them. And then also that would then lead into the AI neurosystem. And so you would connect the neurosystem to IT, and then it would basically propagate from there and connect to all these different areas like uh, the finance area, network operations, uh, facilities management, legal and regulatory frameworks, human resources. I mean, go down the list, all these different areas would then be cross-connected uh, and integrated together to feed back all this data into the system. And, and here's kind of a low level architecture example. And again, just an example, you would have AI and ML instances in all these different areas of operation, in network operations, IT, and then the NOC itself. And what would then happen is quite literally, they would then be connected to yet another kind of smaller and more, uh, I guess you'd say streamlined group of AI and ML instances, and they could be GANs, they could be all sorts of different AI frameworks that would take the, uh, the lower level findings and begin to create a tree of logic basically, or a tree of perception that would then take all that information, begin to filter it, and begin to draw out these kind of correlations that can lead to deeper insight. And so over time, you would have this same framework in every different business instance, and it would then go up into, let's say, a second or third or fourth tier of different GANs or different AI frameworks into transformer frameworks or other AI frameworks, because we'll be using and borrowing from a lot of different areas to create this, and ultimately into the recommendation engine that would then basically convey the results and the observations and the insights to management and the C-suite. And this would involve a uh, federated intelligence model. So you'd be taking all the different AI models, cross-correlating all their data, creating a, uh, a reporting intelligence that would basically then turn to management, as I said before, and, and relay all this information. And again, we would start with perhaps a dashboard on the left, just as an example, then on screen, maybe some form of uh, you know human representation, and then eventually a hologram or some other form of intelligence that would convey this to uh, to basically their, uh, their colleagues on the uh, human side. And so what's interesting about this too, is we have found in actually MIT had discovered this as well, is that the combination of human and machine is actually three X more powerful than either one alone. So machines will have a certain error rate, humans will have a certain error rate, but together they actually reduce the error rate to almost less than a percentage. And so in many use cases that we've examined. And so, Really what we're seeing is this kind of merging of the uh, abilities of both sides of that coin into something that's actually greater and more powerful. And so in terms of work streams, uh, we're looking at different areas. We'll have a series of, <clears throat> excuse me, open models that we'll offer. Uh, we'll work on an open data platform and a middleware solution basically to cross connect all of this from an open source perspective. We'll be looking at, through the lens, looking at it through the lens of open AI op ops or AI operations. And this really could be considered kind of the marriage of business intelligence, the classic uh, way of uh, taking a look at different data around the enterprise and drawing meaning out of it, but also AI ops and the autonomous operation of the enterprise itself and how you can basically take all this together and understand it. 
And that would be under the umbrella of the Federated Intelligence Section, which is uh, right there, number four. So the way we look at this is there are really larger implications uh, for global AI development. And this would be kind of where we've seen those tea leaves begin to gather you know, together in the middle. And uh, what we've noticed is that all these different elements do need to be brought together, integrated, and correlated. And so there's really a lot of benefit for the enterprise, and it's all the obvious things, but through a real, the widest possible frame of insight and being able to take in every single data point and understand what this all looks like. Uh, leads to cost savings, streamlined operations, and really it, it allows us to build a community sourced solution, which is based on real production experience from folks like Raul and Carlo and a tailored list of objectives that we can all adhere to. And then uh, the good news is a lot of existing open source offerings and frameworks can, frameworks can be applied today. Uh, there will be a few things that need to be created, but in essence, all the groundwork has already been laid by open source communities in terms of the tooling we can use. And ultimately, there are cross-vertical applications in financial services or oil and gas, and all these different industries can take this kind of a framework and apply it to their own operations. So it's actually a very exciting time for us. And uh, you know, we're just getting it off the ground, and uh, we've already had meetings and have got things moving. So uh, I'd like to now turn, basically, to, uh, to Carlo and Raul. And I'd like to ask you a few questions along these lines as well. I think um, what's interesting is the fact that America Mobile got involved in this so early on is really exciting. And the fact that you basically not only kickstarted us in this direction, but you're also uh, really embracing the open source, uh, I guess you could say methodology and way of doing things, we think is wonderful. So, um, you know, I think really, maybe you can talk a little bit about the value of collaborating in the open with your peers like Verizon Media, Equinix and others. I'd love to hear about like really what convinced you to do so and to move in that direction. Yes, um, okay. Uh, well, from a telco perspective, um, we started uh, some of the transformation projects in America Mobile some years ago, uh, adopting, I would say a semi-open approach. But uh, I believe we reached a point in which we discovered that we were not uh, flexible enough. So now uh, I believe that uh, the open source world has uh, matured a lot. And we're convinced that uh, now with the industry trends around 5G becoming a reality, I believe that it's the right moment to show that adopting this logic and uh, Contributing back to the open source communities is the right uh, way to unlock innovation for future networks. Well, oh, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. Sorry for the, for the interruption. I, um, we, as Carlo mentioned, uh, we think that uh, the open source uh, projects are now the de facto uh, option no? in order to to solve big challenges. No? So today uh, we see more and more and more challenges coming our way and it will be impossible for us uh, as a single group uh, to tackle all these cons constant change at the pace at, as we are seeing today. No? So, so we are doing this because we think that the future of open source is promising. And from the community, the open source uh, shapes the technological evolution and the creation of an environment that uh, leads to constant innovation. We think that if we do not do this this way, it will be impossible for us uh, in the future. No, it's really exciting. And you guys have been wonderful partners in that regard. Um, and I, I think it's been wonderful to see the industry support, but what about, like, what about the technical value? I mean, what are the advantages of creating this kind of a multinational AI instance to manage and study your global operations in real time and to help you manage them. What do you find to be the value from that perspective? Um, uh, well, usually I think operators like us uh, face very complex maintenance processes. So one of the goals we have is around the processes optimization with the ability to take uh, autonomous decisions considering a uh, dynamic condition. So, in general, adopting uh, an artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning logic 
uh, will give us the advantage to reduce operational costs and uh, at the same time reduce the failures in the network uh, by having this uh, predictive logic. Uh, and uh, as we have uh, operations across most of the Latin American region, uh, we will also have uh, the advantage to learn how to apply this methodology in similar scenarios in all of our opcos uh, with this multinational instance and uh, common knowledge between all, uh, all of the countries. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So we believe we believe that uh, having uh, the technology that focuses on, on predicting and managing the behavior of our operations will allow us uh, to forecast more effectively. No, and also hopefully uh, we we will plan uh, the work assigned in, in our NOx. Uh, hopefully, before every uh, error or mistake uh, occurs, right? So, so before they happen, no? so machine learning will help us to learn faster as well. No? Uh, we think that this kind of technology will develop uh, better solutions as well. Will help us to and leverage uh, and bring better better solutions to our customers. So, uh, we can maintain the stronger platforms in the times that not only uh, MVPs are needed because always the business is pushing to get more solutions as well but we need not only the mvps but also we need to have reliable and 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 to have reliability at speed at the same speed of the uh, of the business no totally agreed and i think that's one of the core values of doing something like this and you know i i think what you're really leading into is something we uh, that was mentioned earlier was just the, the combination of human and machine elements to basically create something um, more powerful from a cognition perspective. Do you do you feel the same way about that? Do you think it's going to be that kind of an outcome? I mean, in terms of your own opinions. It just uh, well, I think that uh, this is a process that, uh, in general, requires uh, maturity. So I expect that initially human knowledge and intervention may be needed. Uh, but uh, the systems uh, learn to recognize situations and uh, correlate them with the solutions and data prepared by experts. So in the way that we feed the, these events into the solution, uh, the solution will know what to do and uh, avoid uh, risky situations for upcoming events. Uh, at the end, of course, uh, we expect that the solution would have uh, enough capabilities and intelligence to take uh, decisions on its own. And Raul, your thoughts? Well, um, on it's interesting how how uh, AI and and human. Uh, cognition are now collaborating in many ways, as you mentioned before. No, I think that in one side the humans train and explain the machine learning models, uh, and also they maintain new and create new models. No, uh, on the other hand, I think the the AI uh, brings more data and better insights. So uh, in a way, uh, AI boosts. Uh, our human potential. No, I think that uh, we can create opportunities uh, for engaging technology in a whole in a whole different way. No, no definitely so. And uh, to do something like this, do you see any advantages to do this kind of development in really an open source community manner, as opposed to more of a proprietary or in-house approach? Like, what would be the benefits as well, in your opinions? Um, yes. Uh, well, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, we started uh, following uh, proprietary approaches uh, with some of these transformation activities within the telco environment. Uh, however, we have seen that uh, these proprietary solutions won't solve at all uh, what has been promised in the industry. So the first uh, thing that we expect is to have uh, technologies and uh, processes solving that uh, that promise 
Then we expect to have uh, cost reduction in, uh, in our processes. And uh, finally, we expect uh, or we believe that contributing back to the open source uh, communities give us the opportunity to enhance the solutions and uh, make them better all the time. Yeah, 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 totally. I, 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 we think that using a proprietary approach uh, will never give us uh, the openness and the flexibility we need in order to build the effective solution. So um, open source communities, from our perspective, uh, create more competition. And when there is more competition, uh, the price is reduced as well. No? So the massive acceptance of a successful open source project is very powerful. So, so we need to provide a neutral home for it. We need uh, to protect it. We need to, de to develop on top of it without uh, any, any other risk of, uh, of, of, uh, for, for this openness or flexibility that we are looking for. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, because this is a Red Hat event, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, uh, the fact that enterprise grade container platforms could be very useful in that regard. And how do you feel platforms like OpenShift and others can contribute effectively to this kind of environment? Um, well, I, I think that uh, OpenShift is uh, one of the most mature solutions to enable a cloud native environment. And uh, uh, we have very high expectations around it to provide all the flexibility necessary for uh, 5G and other uh, future network environments. Uh, also, OpenShift provides very good DevOps tools uh, with a smart uh, lifecycle management of containers uh, through Kubernetes orchestration which uh, give us the advantage to accelerate the development around the new trends, for instance, like uh, network slicing and enabling, for instance, uh, solutions at the edge of the network. So definitely uh, OpenShift is very valuable for, for us. For sure, for sure, for sure. Uh, today, uh, OpenShift allows us to, to take the containers and put them in the right place. Uh, they, it allows us to manage them, shut them, uh, shut them down if we see any problem. We are building today microservices and moving workloads from different clouds. No? But I think that uh, there is so much to be done, that uh, we have not harnessed the full potential of this type of environment. No? So, so container platforms uh, uh, provide an easy and repeatable environment. And, uh... Uh, thank you for your partnership and your leadership in this area with us. I mean, it's been really exciting to work with both of you and America Mobile on this initiative and with our partners. And, uh, wow, I'm just very grateful. And, and just want to thank you both for your time today. And uh, I think we'll leave it at that. But, again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Thank you very much. Hi, folks, um, and thank you, Raul, for joining us today. And uh, there is, I, I just wanted to I put it in the chat, um, but if you're interested in joining in this conversation around um, around the neurosystem and, and other, uh, whatever the, the name that you guys come up with for your community, I know you're, you're in flux right now. Um, I put, uh, uh, lucky, lucky for Bill, I put Bill's email address in the chat. Um, uh, so you can ping him and he can add you to the, the mailing lists and, and everything else and get you into the next upcoming meetings. And um, there is one question in the chat and we're going to probably have to be pretty quick because we're running a little bit behind. Um, and it, Volker is asking, what are good first steps for other operators to get started with AI and eventually deploy AI based solution? So um, I think like to try and answer that, that would be great. And um, and then I will queue up the, the next talk. I think the, the, the first steps uh, are related to knowing what kind of operations would you like to automate, right? Because first, uh, the, the first problem is that you need a better insight, right? So 
what information do you have? It's observable to you. It's uh, what is really actual visible to you, so you can start getting better insights. Once that you have a better visibility or, or observability, then it's going to be easier to start developing models and start making, uh, taking actions on that. No, but I think uh, the first step is uh, to bring everything visible, uh, observable, and to have a, a holistic view from end to end uh, per service, not per platform. It will be more like a, uh, end to end on on a service that, uh, on a service that, that you will pick. I don't know if I explain myself correct. <laughs> I think I think you I think you covered it. Um, I'm going to let you answer. Stay in the chat for a little while online and answer any other questions that come up. And I'm going to now um, queue up the next talk with Paul McLaughlin, uh, not Paul, um, David Cantor, and Peter Matson and Diane Fedema, which is another panel um, and another set of conversations. And so um, give me a second, and I'll queue up that video. And thank you, Raul, for um, for making this happen. And we will. Um, We'll get this all working. So hi Peter, hi David. Um, gonna run the. Just one one thing. I would like to invite everyone to to join us to the to this community and this panel that we are building together. So please uh, uh, be, feel free to contact us, and, and we will be very very uh, happy to have uh, to have you in this framework and this open initiative that we are building together. Uh, sorry, right. thank you. No, definitely. And what, I'll, what I will do is I will send out, once you guys have a landing page and your community name figured out, I will definitely send a note out to all the participants um, and let them know about it. So um, I'm really grateful. This is, this is the entanglement bit that I talked about earlier. Um, there's, everything is fluid and communities are like, I like to think of them as jellyfish that all interconnect. So um, we are now, um, now really um, pleased to bring on um, the ML Commons team and uh, I'm just going to queue up their talk here and let it rip. So we're pleased to be here today at the OpenShift Commons gathering, um, and the topic today is data science. And uh, I'm Diane Fatima from Red Hat. I work in the AI services team. I'm here with David Cantor and Peter Matson. David is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the executive director of ML Commons, and Peter is the president of ML Commons, general chair of ML Perf, and staff engineer at Google. So Peter and David recently launched ML Commons, and we invited them to provide some background and history on ML Commons and ML Perf. And I want to say that Red Hat is really excited to be one of the founding members of ML Commons. So uh, to get us started, tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and some of the work that you do. So um, I'm Peter Matson. Um, I uh, run ML Metrics uh, for Google. I'm interested in majoring all things about ML. And uh, uh, before before that, uh, I, I studied compilers at Stanford. Um, I worked with a startup called Stream Processors and with NVIDIA for a while. Um, lots lots of different uh, opportunities to try and make complex things go fast. As it turns out, that uh, seems to be an eternal need. So decided to be trying to do that for, for ML and also try and make it better as we, we push forward things with MLPerf and ML Commons. David. Uh, yeah, David Cantor. Uh, and so uh, pre-ML Commons, uh, I spent a lot of time in computer architecture. I actually uh, started a microprocessor company that was sort of doing a fusion of uh, compilers and hardware design to uh, exploit more single-threaded performance. And then uh, after that, I ended up consulting with a number of companies, uh, one of which was Cerebra Systems, which is now, uh, uh, like Red Hat, a uh, founding member uh, of ML Commons. And that's sort of how I got involved in this. And I actually have a little bit of uh, background in benchmarking, uh, which kind of came in handy and is uh, part of the reason why uh, I got involved. And it's just, you know, it's it's very exciting to be able to build this kind of a, a, an open community. And we really do uh, appreciate that the, the role that Red Hat is playing. So 
So I don't know how many users are aware that ML Commons uh, originated in MLPerf. What led you to start MLPerf, Peter? I, and um, uh, what were its goals? And how did it evolve into ML Commons? Sure. So um, about um, uh, about three years ago, um, we were looking around at uh, ML, um, and in particular, uh, ML hardware in Google and trying to understand um, you know, how fast were different options. Um, and we decided that we really needed to have a, uh, a good ML performance benchmark. And there did not seem to be an industry standard uh, solution for those. Um, so we uh, rounded up um, a set of usual suspects. Anyone we could we could find that we thought had done uh, the wrong work. Um, so folks like uh, Greg Diamus from Baidu who did uh, DeepBench, the Stanford Donbench folks, uh, Matai Zaharia and, and Peter Bayless, um, and um, the Fathom folks uh, from Harvard. Um, and uh, got everybody in a room and uh, put forth the, the the challenge, like should we should we try and come up with one benchmark uh, for NQDs to measure training performance? And everyone thought that was a great idea. So we came up with a set of rules, um, brought in a bunch more folks from industry, um, strong players um, like NVIDIA, Intel, Startups like uh, Cerebrus, uh, which is like how, how uh, David got uh, sucked in, um, and the benchmark uh, really took off. Um, we had our, our first set of rules out in the middle of um, uh, 2018, um, and then uh, results by the end of that year. Um, we've had several rounds since then. 2019 uh, was a big year of growth. We got into inference. Um, um, we got into uh, HPC. Uh, 2020, we continue to expand. Um, and we also um, started ML Commons, sort of the, um, the, the driving function behind that was we were looking around for a home for ML. We wanted to put in a nonprofit organization. But we wanted something that was engineering focused and ML focused. So open engineering and ML. And we couldn't find that particular combination. We could find large organizations with, uh, like Linux that were, were very um, focused on open engineering in general. And we could find some that were, were focused on ML in particular, uh, like uh, Neuros, but they were more event oriented. And so we decided to start one. Um, you know, we wanted a, an organization that that was their, their reason for being, was to try and come along and make ML better. And we, we put uh, MLPerf into ML Commons. MLPerf is, is still very much uh, going strong and, and growing, but it, it now has uh, oh. We also looked at the field of ML, and we feel like it's a, it's a very young industry, right? It really has uh, a tremendous amount of needs to mature as a field. It needs... It needs, uh, you know, the same things that drove sort of the industrial revolution. Great ways of measuring things. It needs good raw materials, data in the case of ML, and, and it needs good ways of making things, standard ways of making things. You know, a shift from doing things in your basement to, uh, you know, assembly line production at, at high quality. And we wanted to see whether we could form an organization that would, uh, answer that call and try and provide those things and really move the field forward. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so, so that's sort of the, you know, the driving motivation. And I think we kind of ended up with three key pillars that we like to talk about, you know, and that would be the, the benchmarks and metrics, which, you know, we've talked about MLPerf, um, as well as, uh, building large open data sets, which we think are another key ingredient towards really democratizing technology, right? And, you know, the same uh, way that open source really has enabled and fundamentally transformed, like, the art of software, uh, whether software as an art or, or as an engineering, it's just, you know, utterly unrecognizable compared to 30 years ago. And, uh, you know, sort of the 
the analogy is that that data is sort of that same raw ingredient that you need to to start building up machine learning and uh you know the the more large and open data sets we have the more folks are able to extend ml capabilities and use them in products and extend those benefits to the whole world right um and and the third pillar is uh best practices and i, I like to think of this as removing friction right and and uh or or perhaps you know the transition from sewing your own clothes to you know having a, 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 a an abstracted uh, assembly line where there's a real flow and uh, you know today with ml there's a lot of things whether it's model portability or just you know even deploying a model is tremendously high friction but if we want ml to become pervasive we need to drive those sources of friction down so that you know maybe in the future doing things with ml is almost as easy as you know grabbing a library off of github and then you know looking at the comments and maybe asking some questions on stack overflow about gluing it together like that's a future we would love to go towards cool. and we uh, are very fortunate that uh, you know when we went out and started talking about this vision you know it really resonated with a lot of companies um, you know red hat is a founder we've got about uh, 39 uh, companies that are founders and a, a total of over 60 members so some of those are individuals like myself or or academics uh, associated with universities um, and so we've really built this just tremendously vibrant community to focus on advancing innovation in machine learning and kind of extending those benefits through all of society and it's you know very much organized in in the principles of open source right we're very open we like to move fast and iterate okay great so um, are, are most of those members then hardware companies? Can you just go, like give me a little bit of a breakdown there? Sure, yeah. So we absolutely have uh, a lot of hardware companies. Uh, you know, Peter named, named a few like uh, Intel and NVIDIA, as well as, you know, startups like Sentient and so forth. Uh, but we have uh, a number of cloud services companies and software companies as well. We really see uh, this is a big tent where there's a lot of folks who can play. Uh, you know, to name an example of, uh, you know, sort of a more purist software company in some sense, VMware is involved. Uh, there are a number of ML software companies and then a, a lot of uh, uh, cloud providers who provide computing services in, in one fashion or, or another. Um, as well as, you know, sort of very ML focused uh, uh, companies. There's a couple startups that focus on replic replicating uh, experiments and things like that that are engaged. So it's a really lovely, uh, and diverse community, but also across all geos. Um, this is both a blessing and a curse. Um, it, it, for those of you in distributed organizations, you know the challenge of finding a time that works for folks in Asia, folks in Europe, and folks in America, which is there is no such time. But you know, it's great to have such a diversity of participation. Can you give me some examples of projects that are going on in ML Commons? Absolutely. Um, so I'll probably start off with, uh, you know, one or two. Uh, so the MLPerf benchmarks are pretty well known, but one of the things that we are doing is trying to sort of grow the footprint and move into, you know, some some new areas that, that need attention in terms of ML. We started, as, as Peter mentioned, with training. Uh, I got involved and helped to lead doing inference benchmarks. And then one of the things that we branched off to do was to start focusing on mobile phones uh, and, and ML in that context. And then there's some efforts that we have around, uh, you know, sort of the Internet of Things and tiny devices. So that's one way that we've been expanding uh, with different projects in the metrics side. And then one of the things that I think, you know, actually, you know, brought us together, you and me most literally, was ML Cube, which is one of our best practices. Right? And that is a... Uh, that is a set of conventions around containerization that help you sort of abstract the machine learning away from all the other pieces of the infrastructure. And, you know, I like to talk about this in terms of both portability and reproducibility. And, and one of the examples I give of how this can help is when I think about a game changing innovation like BERT, it was first published as a paper by Google, and there's probably some code in TensorFlow. But if you wanted to wrangle that and try that with your customers, you might spend a month or two doing that. 
And, you know, the vision is that maybe one day we can get that down to a day or so or less or maybe even hours so that, you know, if, if you want to use an innovation at Amazon or Facebook and, and try it out on premise or in a different cloud altogether, that becomes frictionless. And I remember, you know, one of the first things that that brought you together with us was you were working with some of our benchmarks and trying to get them to work uh, on on Red Hat. And, you know, it was it was a bit of a struggle. And so in some sense, it was born out of that need and desire. Um, and, you know, uh, we also have some data set projects and uh, I'll let Peter talk about those. As, uh, as David said, there's three big pillars for us, which are um, uh, benchmarks, uh, best practices and data set. Um, I think in many ways, uh, data sets are the new code. Um, they are uh, the way you express what you want your machine learning uh, product to do. Um, the models are, in some sense, a, a lossy compiler for that. Um, and one of the key kinds of data sets that really drives innovation in the field is public data sets. You think about what ImageNet has done for the field. Right. That, that costs something on the order of $300,000 to build, and uh, arguably it's created modern machine learning. We can't build performance benchmarks without good data sets. Um, you can't do good academic research on anything without a good data set. And a lot of the data sets we have now that are really best for their task, and they were kind of created haphazardly. Um, you know, an academic group needed something specific. They created the data set and then moved on. And there's there's a data set out there, usually you know a very modest size compared to what's actually industry, um, often under restrictive uh, licensing terms, um, and it's it's not growing and evolving with the field. And so what we would really like to do with ML Commons is create a, uh, a center of excellence for public data sets, a, a group of people who are really excited about making sure there are good public data sets out there that are, are growing and evolving uh, to suit the needs of the field. Both actual data sets, uh, for instance, we um, just announced uh, the People's Speech, the uh, largest uh, publicly, or soon to be the largest publicly available uh, speech data set by order of magnitude. That includes a, a diverse range of languages. I think it's over 60 languages, um, uh, more diverse range of speakers than what's available now. And we really want to push that forward because uh, you know, that makes uh, speech to te text technology accessible uh, globally if we can get this right. Um, we're also looking at uh, Potentially data sets for recommendation systems, which are incredibly important in the industry, um, and potentially uh, a framework for doing very privacy pr protecting um, medical uh, data sets for accuracy validation for people looking to say, will this model really work in clinical practice? We've got a wide range of projects we're looking into all around this sort of central theme of make good public. Hey, well, that is great. So if someone in the audience right now is really interested in getting involved and, you know, in one of these areas that you've discussed, you know, I'm just wondering where do you need contributors right now and and how could they go about getting on board and helping out? Yeah. So uh, first of all, you know, like like most open source communities, you know, we, we really uh, love folks who show up. And in fact, you know, I uh, just to give you an example of that, uh, I originally showed up to a meeting at, I think, the Stanford Faculty Club, one of our early ones, that was posted through a call on the comp.arc Usenet, uh, right? And and I showed up, and, you know, eventually I did so much good work that I got punished, and they made me executive director, right? <laughs> Take so, that. <laughs> we, we're, we are an extremely uh, open organization. Um, so if you go to our website, to, to mlcommons.org, there's a page about getting involved. It lists out all of our working groups. Uh, you know, I, we've talked about, like, three or four projects, but there's, pro there's over 10 different working groups, you know, everything from – focusing on low power embedded benchmarks to logging to uh, algorithms. And so each of those uh, uh, working groups, we have chairs. Uh, Diane, you are you know one of the chairs for ML Cube. Uh, and so if you go to the page on ML Cube, you'll get to see uh, uh, you know a bit about Diane and what what the project focuses on. So you can look through those and uh, you know we are uh, uh, 
open to individual members and, and many of our projects are open source in nature. So, you know, you can stop by GitHub, sign the CLA and, uh, you know, if you see some bugs, we always love those getting fixed. And, uh, you know, I, I think again, like a lot of open source communities, it's something that, uh, you know, you get as much as you give, right? It's, it, it's the potluck model. And, and so I think there are a number of folks who have kind of wandered in randomly and found that it is, uh, you know, uh, really fits their interests. Uh, some of the folks on the data set side are just phenomenally passionate about speech. And this is just, you know, a really wonderful thing that just aligns with what they want to do. So we, we'd love to see more folks getting engaged. But both from industry and academia, we have uh, quite a few faculty already involved and, and we'd like more. We'd really like to maintain that balance and, and just a, a community that's that's really open and, and, and wants to push innovation, move the whole field forward. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So, and then if you want to get like the links and things, go to mlcommons.org, is that right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a great group of people, very friendly group. So glad I joined it. And uh, so thank you so much for being here today and talking to us. Thanks for having us. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. And, and also, you know, thanks for all of your uh, contributions to the community as well. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, a, a great partnership. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. I am really sad. I, I, I saw your message. I'm, I'm really sad that you're leaving us soon. Oops. Uh, there we go. Um, we have a couple of glitches in the matrix, but um, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for, for being here today. And this is, again, another one of those entanglement moments where um, we're just seeing a lot of cross-community collaboration. So um, there are a couple of questions. Um, one um, quickie was, how do I download the people's speech data set if I want to try it out? So uh, the people's speech data set is currently in review. Um, we don't want to put out a data set until we um, uh, thoroughly score the content and make sure that it really does make a difference in terms of, uh, of quality. Um, so right now, um, some of the ML Commons members have it and they're they're reviewing it. Um, but we'll, we'll be uh, making a uh, presumably splashy uh, public announcement. We, we have it available. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Good um, so if you want to really ask us, uh, join as a member and we'll uh, work. Yeah, that, that's always the great enticement. So um, one other question that's come in is, what are some exciting new applications of AI and ML that you see when working with researchers to consider what new models to include in ML? Perf. You know, Diane, that's one of your things. Um, one of you can take that on. I think you're muted, Diane. Let me just see if I can unmute you. Oh, I think Peter would be great for answering this because he on the research community. <laughs> yeah, so Diane is making it easier for us to take on new models, um, which I think is a, a fantastic contribution. That's the sort of whole push of ML, or MLQ, sorry. Um, the interesting new models that we're really pushing forward with are things around uh, automotive and medical and uh, trying to push uh, sort of cutting edge uh, NLP forward. I think those, those, those three are, are, are pretty exciting for us right now. Yeah. David, I don't know anything you want to, want to add to that. Um, no, I mean, I think that's a, uh... Uh, a pretty good uh, characterization. I think, you know, some of the other things that that are interesting to explore are, uh, you know, good good benchmarks for reinforcement learning. Uh, but then I think one of the other things that there's sort of an art to is, you know, you have to pick benchmarks that are forward looking but not too out there. And so I, I think one of the things that it's incumbent on us to do is sort of be scanning and almost be the advanced pathfinding for some parts of the industry, right? Not not everyone really moves at the same speed. You know, Google has Google Brain, which is fantastic, you know, a huge research organization. But I, I think that part of the goal of ML Commons is to be in the vanguard of doing things like this. You know, the people's speech data set, for example, when that comes out uh, publicly may unlock a lot of new applications in areas that, that we weren't thinking about. The obvious one is speech to text, but there's 
many other things that can be done. All right, then. Now, um, I know we're fluid and we're always behind at stuff. And so if other people ask questions, ask them in the chat using the Q&A window. Is there any last minute things, Diane, Peter or David, that you'd like to add in or people too that you might have missed in, in the answers? I, I think just to reemphasize that we're a rapidly growing community, uh, I think a really mission um, and uh, we'd love to have more members who are excited about uh, data sets, uh, benchmarks, or sort of best practices as the title together. Uh, MLcommons.org, we'd, we'd love to have you. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time today and joining us. I'm going to queue up the next talk on Open Data Hub um, with Audrey Resnick, um, and we'll just talk a little bit about the uh, this reference architecture and this um, joining together of all the pieces and parts into one um, wonderful offering um, at, at OpenShift um, and at Red Hat. So we're really thrilled about it and we're glad that, that you all could join and you'll listen into this and then um, slowly we'll get back on track for the time. So here we go. Thanks guys. Yeah, all right. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So hello everyone, my name is Audrey Resnick. I'm part of the Red Hat OpenShift Data Sciences team. As a data scientist, I've had the pleasure, or maybe the torment, of delivering AI ML models to production. So in a world of Jupyter Notebooks, terminal servers, GitLab runners, S2I containers, and OpenShift, you don't know how glad I am to have discovered Open Data Hub. In this presentation, I'll give you a brief kind of background on how Open Data Hub started, what Open Data Hub is, and hopefully I'll be able to have enough time to conclude my presentation with a quick demo. It's not going to be a live one, it'll be with slides, but the demo will show you how to go ahead and deliver an ML model which dwells kind of into the world of fraud detection. A bit of history on how Open Data Hub started. It started internally within Red Hat as a platform on OpenShift for data scientists to basically go ahead and store their data and run their data analysis workloads, hence kind of the phrase data hub. And fairly early on, it was realized that data scientists and data engineers requirements for tools and really anything to do with AI ML components were pretty different from DevOps requirements. So data scientists, and I can test to this as a data scientist, are mostly UI driven. We really avoid using terminal commands, and we expect the tools, any of the tools that we use, to include our favorite AI ML libraries that we're accustomed to using. Now, collaboration and sharing is also a very important requirement uh, for our workflows to successfully be able to be delivered to production. So the main points of kind of sharing machine learning workflows done um, in notebooks and moving a model to production and managing the mode while in production, monitoring it, making sure that your predictions are accurate, watching for any data drifts, um, resource usage, GPU, uh, memory and whatnot. Those are all very important to us. And these are um, things that were combined together as multiple tools and components to kind of obtain an end-to-end -end AI ML platform. Hence, we have this open data hub um, being not a single application, but really a platform with multiple tools running on OpenShift. Okay. So Open Data Hub is really how Red Hat does artificial intelligence and machine learning internally on OpenShift. And we've learned quite a lot from running machine learning workflows on OpenShift. We faced kind of still face a lot of challenges and issues that we try to kind of resolve and provide solutions in the open data hub. Issues and challenges, there are maybe three or four. Uh, first of all is the people in the AI ML projects. There's always a team of data scientists, data engineer, DevOps, product owners, business developers that need to collaborate and work together. Secondly, there's sharing and collaborating around the AI ML development is difficult. 
sometimes, well, most of the time it can be manual and really can be error prone. Thirdly, another important challenge are just the computer resources themselves. AI ML workloads are compute heavy and CPU, memory, storage are not unlimited resources. I think we all know that. Um, and definitely they're not unlimited resources in any uh, development or production environments that we're working with. And fourthly, which is the final challenge and one that is very critical, is de delivering to production and the production development life cycle. Sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds. So today, Open Data Hub internally runs uh, AI ML work workloads uh, such as application logs. So in our uh, internal Open Data Hub clusters, we run anomaly detection on multiple Red Hat application logs. We have cluster metrics. We gather and analyze the cluster metrics, or sorry, the cluster logs from OpenShift clusters, and we have an AI ops team dedicated to finding or predicting any issues that may occur there. And finally, we have customer support data. So on our customer service side, we store and analyze uh, any of the SO uh, reports, customer feedback, and many other different types of customer data. So we've kind of gone through the history. Let's go and take a look at really what is specifically Open Data Hub. So Open Data Hub, uh, first and foremost, is an open source project div driven by an open source community. It's a collection of tools and components that make up the end-to-end -end AI ML platform specifically on OpenShift. The AI ML workflow starts with prepping and basically transferring the data into a data lake or storage and making it accessible for data scientists. When we look at what the data scientists do, um, we're really looking at the next phase, which is model development. And what we're doing is we're looking at the data analysis of our data, picking certain features, uh, going ahead and creating a model, going ahead and then training, and then doing some model uh, validation. The very last phase goes into the DevOps uh, realm. Oops back up to the DevOps uh, realm. And that's really moving and serving the model into production. This phase is not kind of a static one-stop uh, model serving delivery phase, but it's a constant optimization phase. So the cycle of monitoring, optimizing, and serving is a constant cycle that happens really for the lifetime of your model. And at, again, at the end of the day, it's that collaboration between your data engineers, your data scientists, your DevOps, and any of your business developers that you have. So next, what I wanted to basically show, is, show you is just a diagram and show you where you can actually find Open Data Hub. So first and foremost, Open Data Hub is an operator that's installed from the OpenShift uh, operator hub. So you see that I have an OpenShift uh, screen here, and we can go ahead and then choose the Open Data Hub. And when you look at the Open Data Hub, you're able to see that there are various tools that you might be able to use. So if you're a data scientist, you'd be very interested in using Jupyter Hub. Um, maybe for some of the business analysts, you might be interested in using Grafana to take a look at some of your uh, results from the model that you've deployed. Now, Open Data Hub integrates open source projects into, as I mentioned, an end-to-end -end AI ML platform on OpenShift. So we go ahead and we take all of these different open source projects, such as Kubeflow, and we adapt them to run on OpenShift. And we package them basically within an operator, and then we go ahead and offer it on Operator Hub. So of course, Kubeflow is pretty big, and this, and the central component in Open Data Hub, and we add other components. And you can see them on the screen there. We add things such as Grafana, Spark, Prometheus, Jupyter Hub, Kafka, etc. So this slide here really shows all the different tools and components that are provided um, by the Open Data Hub platform, and it just addresses basically a specific functionality in the end-to-end uh, -end AI ML workflow. And again, this will look very similar to the slide that we saw just two slides ago, where first of all, we focus on data analysis. We have storage integration, which could be our Ceph storage, 
uh, working with PostgreSQL or MySQL. Uh, we have to have some way of doing data exploration, so we might use uh, Superset or Hue. If we're interested in our metadata, we might have something as Hive Metastore. Uh, then for big data processing, we may use something as Spark. Uh, those are things that the data engineer and the business analyst are very interested in. Then we move on to the artificial intelligence and machine learning, so the data scientist domain. In a data scientist, they may jump into an interactive notebook such as uh, Jupyter, go and go and do some of their work in there. If they want to go ahead and train, fine tune their model or work with a distributed model, they may use something as PyTorch. They may use something like Spark. For uh, machine learning applications themselves, uh, there might be various libraries that they're interested in. In that case, they can use the Open Data Hub AI library. And then finally, they're going to go ahead and look at how they can deliver some of their, their services for their model or deliver their model through Kubeflow pipelines or maybe Airflow. That brings us uh, to the production side where we're going to go ahead and deliver what we've created to the DevOps engineer. So again, when they're looking at the model serving, they may use something as seldom. A uh, way to deliver some of the services, again, might be using something uh, pipelines such as Kubeflow pipelines or maybe Argo. And then finally, if we want to actually take a look in what's going on with our model, we'll use some sort of monitoring tools, such as Grafana or Prometheus. So the Open Data Hub um, comes with an ecosystem. And again, this is provided by Red Hat and certified partners. And basically to um, help enable our customers, we built this ecosystem around this Open Data Hub. And we feel that it provides our customers with a faster go-to-market strategy. So if we take a look at the product integration, this ecosystem provides tools for tighter integration with Red Hat products, such as Red Hat OpenShift, um, Ceph Storage, uh, OpenShift Service Mesh. Uh, we can go all the way to Red Hat 3Scale API Management. To actually get help with some of those items, uh, we do have Red Hat consulting engagements. So as part of the ecosystem, we have that dedicated AI ML consulting services team to help our customers succeed in their digital transformation efforts or plans and really accelerate their, their time to market with what they're trying to do. A very important part of this is our Red Hat certified partners. Um, we work with third-party vendors to get them certified to use UBI images and certified operators. Then these partners become certified partners that will provide support for their tools integrated with Open Data Hub. And we could look at some things such as Selden or Anaconda, anything that we might use for, for model serving, et cetera. And finally, we have industry use cases. So basically to go and showcase these integrations, we've built multiple industry use cases showcasing how we're using Open Data Hub integrated with the Red Hat products, again, such as uh, fraud detection with Open Data Hub and the Red Hat Decision Manager. So what I'd like to do is just give you kind of a slide demo to show how I would go ahead and do some fraud detection within a bank to give you an idea or flavor of how you can work with OpenShift and Open Data Hub to actually deliver your solution. So the first thing that we're gonna do is just basically log into your OpenShift account. From there, we are going to go and proceed to the Open Data Hub dashboard. We're logged in as a developer and to do any of the navigation, we would use the left panel navigation bar. So right now we're looking at the topology. So I would just proceed to the Open Hub dashboard by clicking on the ODH dashboard operator and then click the Open URL button. What will happen is we'll be presented with some sort of Open Data Hub screen and we'll have a large choice of options to choose from. As I mentioned, ODH contains a number of tools that you can build and manage and deploy your models. We're going to take on the role of a data scientist and work on a fraud detection model. So what we're going to do is click on the Jupyter Hub card to open Jupyter Hub and go ahead and begin programming. So when we open uh, Jupyter Hub, we're first going to have an option to determine the type of notebook that we're going to use. We're just going to use a basic um, machine learning workflow notebook uh, that we can use to deploy a fraud detection model. And again, just a reminder, we're looking at legitimate and fraud fraudulent transactions that are in a bank. So we would go ahead and just accept the other defaults and choose Spawn to continue. 
I've actually gone ahead and uh, pulled in the notebooks through a Git repository. So in this case, uh, when you go into your Jupyter notebook and you pull in your notebooks, you'd be able to see them. And in this case, we have uh, some of our feature engineering and model re logistic regression and services notebooks that we use to deploy our fraud detection model. When we put the model into production, we actually go back to the OpenShift side and we use pipelines. So we're deploying the machine learning pipelines into production with OpenShift pipelines, and we'll see how we can use the services to make predictions. When we go back to the main OpenShift console and select pipelines, you'll see um, in this case, there's a pipeline that we've already created. So what we do is we could click on the pipeline and see the pipeline details. Now remember, this pipeline is going to help deliver our models or our model. So once the pipeline is finished, we have a model or a REST service that's built uh, with source to image or S2I. And at this point, what we'll want to do is take that pipeline service, more specifically the URL, because we're going to be using that URL, and you'll see at the bottom I have a service URL such as pipeline, operator, data hub, user one, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll be using a request library in Python to interact with our REST service that we've just managed to deploy. So if we go jump into the Jupyter notebook to interact with our model services, we'll go ahead and just replace our default host with that generated URL from those pipeline services that we have running. And then if we go ahead and run our uh, services, make that request, and then run our model, we'll have the model making its predictions. In this case, we have a lot of legitimate predictions on the right-hand side of the screen you can see under predictions. That could mean that we're very good. Uh, we, we, if we, as we'd run this model a little bit longer, we'd probably see some fraudulent predictions coming up. Um, all in all, that looks very good. So then what we want to do is we want to actually go and take a look at graphically uh, what our legitimate and fraudulent detection transactions look like over time. So we can go back to ODH and we would launch Grafana. Uh, we would log into Grafana and then we would get in touch with the pipeline service that we had running, and then we'd be able to visually monitor our service for fraudulent and legitimate transactions. And I apologize for the screen being sort of, or the screen capture being sort of fuzzy, but what that's doing is, um, what it's showing you is over the course of a day, the number of legitimate transactions, which can, um, should be a lot larger than the fraudulent detections which we are detecting. So through that very, very short slide demo, you have the ability to visually Sorry about that. Now we have the ability to visually monitor our service for fraudulent and legitimate transactions, and that's all going through using the Open Data Hub services where we were able to deploy a Jupyter notebook and go ahead within that Jupyter notebook and at the end of the day get our model running and then go back into Open Data Hub for another tool that will allow us to actually see some of the services that we have running from our model in the back end. And that concludes my demo and my kind of recap on Open Data Hub. I hope that you found this useful and I look forward to answering any questions uh, that you may have. Well, um, thank you, but Audrey's not going to be answering any questions that you may have as there's been a glitch in the matrix and um, though she was wonderful in giving that um, presentation, um, she's not available to answer your questions. So instead, um, I have uh, Sherard Griffin with me um, who is the head of AI services at Red Hat and um, if you have questions, if there's one I can see in the Q&A here now. I'm just going to go down and check it out um, that just came in. And um, I think it's more of a technical question there, Waleed, so I'm going to hang that one up for a minute um, and maybe ask a bit of a softball question um, to Sherard while I look for an answer to that one. Um, could you tell us, Sherard, a little bit about why we created um, Open Data Hub at Red Hat? Um, and, you know, what did we see the customers, you know, what did the customers, what were the customers asking us that made us see that there was a need for something like ODH? Oops, and there we have another glitch in the matrix. We have... Oh, no, that's on my end. <laughs> Sorry, I had too many mutes. 
had my headset and my uh, laptop muted. Uh, that's actually a very interesting question, Diane. And um, when we look at when we first started engaging with customers and talking them, to them about their about AI, uh, it was very it was it was a very clear message that they wanted to continue using their investment in open source and Red Hat technology. Uh, you know, there's a a big movement behind open source. Open source is the driver for a lot of the AI innovation. And instead of uh, customers having to have specialized hardware or specialized infrastructure to do their AI, they wanted to see ways in which they could leverage what they've already invested in. Um, but in order to do that, Red Hat is very much a plat. It's a it's an infrastructure company first and foremost. Uh, we knew we couldn't just start to get into the AI space with our own vision on and and, and not just not look at what's going on with the broader ecosystem. Uh, it's very important with Red Hat that we work with our partners, that we work with other open source communities to be a part of something bigger than just a single technology. And so Open Data Hub allowed us to do exactly that. Uh, we knew it, it, it had to be what's the bleeding edge technology in AI right now? How do we bring that to OpenShift into Kubernetes to allow for more scalable workloads for our customers? And then do it in a way that didn't isolate our partners that helped us get to where Red Hat is today. You know, how do we continue to work with uh, partners, whether that's uh, on the infrastructure side? You know, we work with some partners that are in the AI space, like a Profit Store, uh, for being able to optimize uh, how your infrastructure is run, all the way through new partners that we've identified that help us tell better stories about managing your data or even just the AI ML in general, you know, partners like Cloudera and SaaS and, and H2O and Anaconda. Uh, so taking that same mindset of how Red Hat has operated its business for the past, you know, 15, 20 years and applying that to AI was really how we ended up resolving on Open, uh, open Data Hub and, and why we felt the need to be able to highlight that you can continue to use open source, not only open source applications, but also open source in infrastructure to help solve data science. Right. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for stepping up to the plate uh, here. Um, if you have other questions, um, Waleed, I will get um, back to you on those two issues that you posted um, in, in yeah. the chat. And, and, and yeah. I can actually respond to that because, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Waleed, and we can certainly follow up offline as well. Uh, we are really working hard on the disconnected install. This is, we identified it as, as two different things. And for those not familiar, when we, when we talk about uh, looking at technologies like the edge or even for some, some industries like uh, uh, financial services where it's really critical to be able to wall off your, your infrastructure or certain parts of your infrastructure so to decrease the vulnerabilities. Um, you know, we're looking at ways in which we can install open data hub and some AI components in a way that allows for that disconnected nature when you don't have access to the outside internet. So right now we, we've been meeting over the past couple of weeks to really come up with a stronger story of how we're going to answer that. From the engineering side, we already have someone that's fully dedicated for the next few weeks to specifically solve uh, helping to bring disconnected installs to open data hub. But it's also a broader topic because we're starting to look at ways in which the platform and the infrastructure needs to be able to enable that uh, out of the box without having to do special things on the application layer. Uh, we don't want we don't want all of our ISVs and our partners to be able uh, to have to do something special for disconnected installs. Uh, so there's multiple things going on there. I guess the roundabout way to say from for the short term. Uh, our, our engineering efforts have kind of refocused on solving that and we put we put a full time person on that. But then we're also having deeper conversations on the platform level to support the use case in a broader sense. All right. Well, thank you very much for um, for stepping up and for having an answer at hand on, on the disconnected install one. So that was that was great. So. Um, I'm going to queue up our next talk, um, which is the, from Verizon Media and Ganesh here with us today. Uh, and we've been really pleased with the collaborations that have been going on um, with Verizon Media and looking forward to this. And it's a nice um, way to segue into using all the pieces and parts of, um, of the different AI space and data uh, science um, initiative. So I'm going to start that one up and um, let it rip.
hello everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be here at the OpenShift Commons Gathering Data Science. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very interesting era where we are starting to take a closer look at uh, how data and AI is going to transform a lot of our experiences. I'm Ganesh Harinath. I'm with Verizon, Verizon Media. Uh, I've been doing data and AI for a very long time, over a decade closely. And uh, an interesting paradigm shift that I started to see, we were building platforms which were very heavily AI driven on the cloud. And uh, we're starting to see application demand where we have to start to move these capabilities onto the edge. So throughout the presentation, I'll be citing our experiences in terms of how we look at these applications, how we solve these applications using frameworks, platforms, and so on. But uh, most importantly, I feel very, very blessed to be part of this ecosystem where I am experiencing how the world would be transformed through AI for uh, better experiences, uh, performance, efficiencies uh, around healthcare, and then so on. And uh, when you start to take a closer look at it, uh, moving forward five, 10 years, robotic arm surgery is going to be very, very normal. And what that means is a doctor from New York can perform a surgery on a patient in Los Angeles. To me, this is fascinating. And interestingly, when you take a closer look at what's required for all these things to happen, robotics is important. A virtual reality is very important. And artificial intelligence uh, is the foundation for this capability. And most importantly, we being part of Telco, 5G would enable to converge these technologies to make this capability a reality in uh, years to come. But when we start to uh, ground ourselves and then take a closer look at where we are today, what we are trying to do with ML and AI, a uh, uh, lot of applications that really require massive data on the cloud applying AI uh, to understand various aspects of the network was one of the area that I was very, very focused on. But uh, uh, looking forward, uh, industrial automation is a space where we are starting to uh, uh, understand, build capabilities and solutions uh, to the right. On the left, uh, autonomous cars. Uh, I'm fascinated. Uh, there's a long way to go. But uh, the autonomous car today can look at the car in front. But what needs to happen is to be able to really connect to 5G capabilities and apply AI to plan the entire route, and that's in play as well. And these are like uh, fascinating changes that we all are living through. And uh, interestingly, uh, the shift has been accelerated. But the way how I summarize my experience, uh, any application that we would actually touch, feel, see, uh, would be powered by AI. But it's also equally important that uh, aspects like uh, uh, AI bias should be taken into account when designing these applications. Now, to summarize how the application uh, shift is happening, when you take a closer look at any machine learning application, I'm sure we all know there is an aspect of uh, model training, which is very compute intensive, and there is aspect of inferencing. And in today's world, very easily we deploy both uh, training and inferencing on the cloud and have this ML AI experience directly from the cloud. But if there's one shift that we are actually starting to see, the demand of near real-time inferencing, and uh, now we are talking about inferencing in milliseconds, we are talking about inferencing in milliseconds at massive scale, near, you're talking uh, hundreds and thousands of inferencing happen th that needs to happen uh, within a very short duration. In order to accommodate this, uh, we are starting to see a paradigm shift, and that is moving the inference capability very intelligently and seamlessly from the cloud to the closest location where the need is. So some of the application, uh, if the inferencing is of the order of 10 to 25 milliseconds, that's just an estimate, then ideal, you deploy these inferencing onto the CDN edge. We VMG, we have CDN edge in 160 location. We are already in the process of enabling 
these uh, CDN edge with intelligence through a platform called Leo, which I would cite in a few minutes. And most importantly, there are a lot of applications which really need inferencing near real time at massive scale, and most importantly, highly real, reliable. In order to accommodate the uh, uh, factor of high reliability, and also the act, uh, aspect of millisecond inferencing, uh, we have to start moving inferencing to a uh, two-year box is what I call. Now, uh, an important paradigm shift when we go back and uh, uh, start to understand uh, evolution of internet in the very, very beginning, it used to take fairly long for pages to download when we access uh, yahoo.com from Sydney, but magically capabilities like CDN uh, was enabled to cache content geographically in different locations. And this technology happened uh, uh, behind the scenes where a sudden change in human experience happened in terms of using the internet. Everybody started to have consistent experience of internet and CDN is magic. Uh, so today, when we start to take a closer look at how we want to deploy applications, uh, enabling the CDN edge to be able to deploy ML applications is very, very critical. And uh, there's a transformation or change that's actually happening in this area as well. Now, what are the applications uh, that are really being discussed right now? And why really we would need uh, inferencing to happen uh, so near real time? And what, what exactly is a big problem? There is another very important paradigm shift that we all, I'm sure, started to notice. Uh, up till until now, a lot of ML applications were actually primarily driven by signals from sensors. They're very two-dimensional, they're records. And there are billions of records. In, in fact, uh, the platforms that our team really uh, operate, uh, build applications, we ingest 100 billion records every day. But uh, it's very easy even to operationalize platforms which can ingest and process 100 billion records because you have that luxury to be deployed on the cloud. And most importantly, the inferencing aspect is on a two-dimensional record. And the shift is the video content from where we have to pick up intelligence, apply machine learning to surface insights and solve the problem. That's another huge paradigm shift. And uh, it's no exaggeration when I take a closer look at a lot of applications that come our way that we are starting to work on, majority of the applications are camera driven in, in, in space of factory automation. And what we are seeing right now is an example of factory automation where you have video cameras which is up, uh, under, observing the assembly line. And these feeds would be fed to a platform like Leo where you'd have applications which can understand the video signals, inference, and alert if there are issues, alongside other, uh, other sensory signals like temperature, current, and other things. So, so factory automation uh, is a space or area where we are continuing to invest a lot in building applications, and I call it a 2U box. We have to deploy a 2U box. We need a platform like Leo. We need applications staying closer to the edge that way we have that reliability, both in terms of high volume inferencing and also ensure that it is seamless and it's actually working uh, in a factory environment. And uh, 5G private definitely is going to play a big role to connect all these different sensors, uh, cameras and so on and route uh, signals and video streams to a platforms, a centralized platform which can ingest and uh, apply uh, artificial intelligence and start to surface insights to improve efficiencies, to avoid error near real time uh, without any material loss. And uh, this is an area uh, we Verizon are starting to heavily invest. Uh, I'm sure many of you know Verizon already has a company called Skyward, which was acquired a few years ago. Uh, they are into helping fly drones. Now, knowing Verizon has tens of thousands of cell towers, uh, having technologies like drone and computer vision and so on, it's, uh, it's very timely that we, we start to build applications instead of people climbing on the cell tower to understand issues with the towers and connections and so on. 
fly drones to understand the issues around those cell towers. One, uh, it addresses a lot of uh, safety issues. Two, it addresses uh, 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 the, the lot of, sorry, there's a lot of cost efficiencies uh, attributed as well. And most importantly, uh, with computer vision, you really see uh, a lot of insights where you can take corrective actions near real time. And uh, we're continuing to invest. And this is kind of a very vertical application. Today, you solve it for cell tower. Cell towers, you can retrain it to monitor oil pipelines, buildings and bridges, and then so on. I personally am very, very fascinated uh, about the uh, mission that we uh, embarked on. We are very, very early on, though. Uh, there's a lot of learning here, but uh, I'm sure uh, in months to come, we'll be able to operationalize products like what we are discussing right now. And uh, it really requires edge capability. Uh, the, the video streams coming near real time, inferencing on the edge, uh, and then being able to provide surface, uh, in, sorry, being able to surface insights to the person who's really uh, conducting the sur survey uh, of uh, the cell tower or an antenna. Now, how can we how can we solve all these things? Uh, efficiently is the term that I would actually like to use. When we take a closer look at uh, the next generation application, pretty much every application would uh, have an aspect of machine learning attached to it. But the very interesting difference between the application that are powered by machine learning and traditional applications uh, is the, app, uh, the machine learning applications are not uh, static. I can't say uh, the release is complete. This is an awesome application. You, you guys go ahead and then use it. We really have to start to monitor the model and have a process in place to really retrain the model to make it more re meaningful, relevant, and accurate on the ground. And that's a non-trivial problem. And uh, that's where we need to have an ecosystem that supports the next gen uh, building and deployment of next generation application. The ML-based applications can't be transactional. I can't say I've deployed the application and I can't walk away. I need to provide tools and capabilities which can be used to ensure that these applications are meaningful over a period of time. And uh, that's very important on one side. On the other hand, be able to distribute the workload, the training workloads on the cloud and the inferencing workloads on the edge. In simple terms, I call the pink boxes and the blue boxes were deployed on the cloud. Now, eloquently, we have to separate these uh, pink boxes to the closest edge, which could be a CDN edge or a 2U box, which would empower you to build applications like uh, a drone vertical inspection, uh, applications like factory automation, and then so on. So we are very heavily invested uh, in operationalizing uh, uh, the capability of platform, which helps, empowers us to build uh, edge applications seamlessly. So what you're seeing is a very high level blueprint of the platform Leo, uh, where the pink boxes are taken care of as part of uh, the model inferencing and application deployment. And this application deployment has to be end to end. We should be able to run UI. It has to be secured. And this to me is a paradigm shift. We all talk about a distributed infrastructure. Now we are talking about a distributed application where uh, the same drone inspection, the same factory automation has to be deployed in multiple location. And in many cases, it has to be integrated on the cloud to make it work very, very seamlessly. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating uh, time uh, where the demand for infrastructure is changing, the security posture is changing. Uh, we just can't say we have an awesome cloud uh, uh, infrastructure in multiple locations. Uh, it's micro clouds, and these micro clouds have to be connected to the parent cloud primarily because your application loads are distributed on the edge and on the cloud with seamless interconnect. And what you're seeing is a reflection of our view uh, about a year and a half ago, and today what, what you're seeing is real. So Leo is a glue between various technology infrastructures, platforms, uh, and integration between data sensors and so on, 
which will enable and empower to build different applications like drone inspection, factory automation, digital twin that has been operationalized for Verizon's own good within Verizon. And I'm sure we all have our own strategies, but uh, I'm very excited and encouraged to share uh, the success that we are actually starting to see uh, about uh, uh, understanding the needs of the edge platform and uh, uh, ironing out the capabilities that are actually needed on, on, on the edge. Now, in a nutshell, when you take a closer look at a Leo, you can build an end-to-end -end application on Leo, which can ingest data, which can apply inferencing at massive scale on the edge, and uh, be able to uh, deploy any machine learning model. And most importantly, this is container-based. So what that translates to is it can be deployed on any uh, uh, edge platform. But as I was mentioning, it's very important to have a seamless interconnect to the cloud because it's just only portion of your application and a lot of the training needs to happen on the cloud and that there could be compliance policies where you have to persist data on the cloud. And this data has to be shipped onto the cloud for various reasons. And uh, most importantly, a fascinating uh, approach of building models. This is called distributed uh, model training. Uh, which can be consolidated on the cloud, can be approached through platforms like Leo. Now, at a very high level, uh, for us, when you take a closer look at uh, what are the capabilities that we would need on the edge, data management is super important, be able to ingest data, all forms of un kinds of data, high throughput, and so on. And it should uh, empower us to build end-to-end -end applications with UI, very secure, and so on. And most importantly, the security posture has changed because you have a 2U box uh, sitting somewhere. Physical security becomes important. Application security becomes important too. These things have to be factored in, This, which is beyond Leo, but we need to have a strategy to address all aspects of security. And Leo does address application security. We would have to depend on uh, uh, edge enablement capabilities uh, like OpenShift as well in this case to ensure that it is seamless. We can control or manage the container seamlessly on the edge uh, and also provide a very secure environment to deploy edge applications. And most importantly, uh, have a strategy in place where you have components where you can deploy models, seamlessly manage it, monitor it, uh, and uh, most importantly, perform near real-time analytics too. And everything that I have said uh, is part of Leo. It's operationalized, and we have been very, very successfully been using within uh, Verizon. Uh, and interestingly, though it's very, very early, Leo has become the North Star Edge architecture for Verizon Media Group as we speak. Now, to conclude, uh, we are starting to see uh, a, a new influx of application. I call this as next generation application. And these applications, each one of them would be powered by AI, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, they're poised to enhance human experience and efficiencies and health and safety and so on. But the paradigm shift from the infrastructure perspective is we have to understand and identify the components that have to be moved closer and closer to the edge. It could be a CDN edge or a 2U box. Now, I think with that, uh, the way how I would like to summarize a lot of uh, the stories and experiences that I have explained, uh, uh, it's it's a very very it's going to be very very interesting as we move forward. Primarily, as you start to take a closer look at building uh, ML and AI based applications, uh, it's complex. We have to find ways to simplify this through a platform strategy. We need to have a strategy and partnerships in place where we have control on the edge and uh, uh, technologies like OpenShift definitely will put us in a very, very good situation to have a very controlled and manageable uh, environment taking into account it's very, very distributed too. 
Uh, and most importantly, how are we going to build, test, deploy, keep the environment very agile, that way it's adaptive, adaptive too. So, uh, uh, so taking all these things into account, we're very early on, uh, we have our own experiences, very happy to uh, learn your experiences too, uh, connecting offline. Uh, and also, I'm starting to look up to consortiums like a Neurosystem. I'm, I'm really excited and happy to be part of it. And also I feel very blessed to be part of an ecosystem like this. While we bring in what we know, uh, primarily from experience perspective in terms of solving problems on the edge, uh, building ML and AI applications for Verizon, Verizon Media, and other enterprise customers that we are starting to work with, uh, we're here to learn uh, as part of the ecosystem and become more and more efficient uh, as we continue to build our next generation applications, uh, which I envision would change a human experience, which would improve efficiencies. And also most importantly, uh, I'm excited about uh, the security posture, improving security posture, and also uh, health and safety too. So with that, I sincerely thank you all very much uh, for this opportunity uh, and uh, look forward to uh, sync up with you offline as part of consortiums and then we can take it from there. Most importantly, uh, stay safe. Uh, I'm sure you're all going to have a fantastic and uh, terrific 2021. Thank you.